On the flight back from Nashville, he gave the airplane bathroom the Fitzsimmons Starbucks treatment. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice but get a mandate, you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Excited that Fitz Dog is in studio. Good to see you, my friend. I'm so proud of you breaking in that bathroom on the plane. Uh, nothing <laughs> sets... Some people take Xanax for a flight, mm-hmm. but rubbing one out gently, mm. and I'm talking freestyle. You got no porn. Mm. All you have is the image of the best-looking passenger you saw on the way to the bathroom. Or pilot or stewardess. I mean, anyone on that aircraft. There's female pilots? I had a female pilot uh, flying out, yeah. Was mm-hmm. there was there planes behind you honking? <laughs> no, she wasn't Asian. <laughs> she, she was black. But uh, there was a dude, no, sorry, co-pilot female. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's good. Honky in control. I, I really always feel bad for pilots because, like, you always figure, like, that was their dream. You know, your dream was to be... Uh, what was your dream when you were a kid? <laughs> um, my my dream when I was a kid was to play football. Oh, that's right. And then it yeah. morphed into... Well, actually, my very early dreams were like real, you know, four or five-year-old things. was like drive a dump truck, uh-huh. operate a crane, yeah. you know, Tonka toy dreams, you know. Right. Then it sort of morphed into football. Then... It, it got real basic for a long time, which is find a job. Like yes. that, that, that was my dream, move yeah. out of my dad's garage. Right, right. And then at some point, it became comedy. Yeah. But because that wasn't like, it early. You picture the pilot like that was his dream. And he, you know, played with little planes when he was a kid. And then, you know, went to flight school. They got to do like 2,000 hours of flying. And, then, mm-hmm. and now he's a pilot and he's flying the plane. He's, you know, floating above those white clouds, heading mm-hmm. off into the wild blue yonder, followed his dream. And then all of a sudden he's got to be a credit card salesman. Yes. He gave the pitch. Yeah. He if gave he, the pitch for the uh, American Airlines mileage plus platinum if you, members. If you, know. you, if you spend $20,000 in the next five days, we'll give you a companion ticket. Uh, also, and I'm going to make it a little worse. He spent his dreams, his dreams as a kid was flying. Yes. But he ended up in an F-18 or a Hornet or a, you know, F-4 Phantom or something. And he was living his dreams in a supersonic piece of military equipment, you know, hitting opportunities of target on his way back from Da Nang, you know, like really living his dream. And now he's flying a bus filled with poor people who are fighting and pitching the credit card. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and at the end he has to he has to he has to say goodbye to everybody. It's like a yes. comic at the end of a show selling his merch. Yes. He's got one more credit card pitch on the way out. Yeah, that's what I was doing in Huntsville before I got on the plane. Let's just buy a book. They're so heavy. We don't want to have to carry them back. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy merch. Books are crazy merch. Well, look, the the merch, okay, let me explain my dedication to merch, because I just went out and took two big roller bags of merch. Yeah. Okay? Now, it really, I think people will quickly dismiss it as being cheap or thrifty or wanting cash or whatever it is. It's really none of the above for me. It's you know this because you wrote, uh, dear Mister Mrs. Fitzsimmons. Yeah, nice call. Yeah, thank you. Very funny book. Thank you. When you're done writing a book, the book company calls you and they go, "We got 3,800 units left. Yeah, would you like us to burn them in a ceremonial <laughs> fire for a failure? <laughs> or that's what I hear. Yeah. Or was we'll it give them to you for free? Yeah. Uh-huh. Now you write six books. And next thing you know, you have a warehouse filled with cases of books. Because every book, they have three to 5,000 left over. Yeah. And they will, I always go, give me the books. And then I get the books, like Johnny Appleseed, and every time I just pack 25 books. Yeah. And I just spread them around the U.S. Now, I don't do it to make money. I do it to get rid of the books and to physically get cash. Yes. Because I don't have cash anymore. It's good for valets and things like well, that. Well, here's, here's my merch. 
And I'm not ashamed of selling merch after a show. I feel like people at the end of a show, if they really enjoyed it, they want to take something home. They want to remember the night, you know? Right. So I have that's these. That's where herpes comes in. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You can yeah. take a lot of stuff home to LA. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have these little pins. It's the Greg Fitzsimmons pin. It's got my face and name on it. Mm -hmm. And I sell them for 10 bucks and it's cash only. There's no Venmo, uh, there's no credit cards. Lightweight. It's light. I got a bag. I bring a bag. I bring, I bring 200 of them. Right. Easy. Smart. And that's it. And then. Uh, and and the best part is is like uh, you, when you when you do Venmo or any of that, you always get one blockhead who stands there unlocking his phone, yes, trying to. Fit. <laughs> Meanwhile, you got people streaming by. So cash, right. they walk up, somebody takes their money, shake their hand, keep it moving. Agreed. Now it's back to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the, of the airplane. I did something I never do on a commercial flight. Yeah, I did some offloading. Nice. I took a dump. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whoa. I never do it, but, and I, you know, I feel like I need to make an excuse because I've taken a stand on this. Yeah. You stood when you did it? <laughs> That's the well, way to go. Well, <laughs> as I was taking my six-foot-two frame and, and folding it <laughs> into this lawn chair and sitting on that commode, yeah. I've, and each knee is hitting, one's hitting the side, yeah. other's hitting the sink, and I was thinking... A big person would have a lot of trouble, and maybe that's baked into the design. Yeah. Maybe we don't want the uh, heifers offloading <laughs> right. in there. But I was like barely making it, and I'm not a big person. But the excuse is this. Um, I drive home from Huntsville after doing two shows on a, on a Sunday, get back to the airport Hilton or whatever it is in Nashville, uh, you know, go to bed at midnight, get up at 545. Mm. The system is not mm. working as it normally works. Yeah. Go to the airport, wait in line, have a cup of coffee. And then at some point, what used to be taken care of at home or in the hotel room is now going to have to be negotiated with on an aircraft. It's an away game. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm. But I, I did my business, work, work nicely. But I did think there's no way. Some of these people I see on this flight are going to make it onto this toilet. Well, the other difficult thing is the wipe because the bowl is so small. Just yes. getting your hand I don't have the elbow. You. I don't have my elbows hitting right. the bulkhead. Right. You yeah. almost have to do a female wipe and go from the front. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yes, but don't pull it towards your ball sack. You're going from the front, but you're pushing back. Oh, it's more Zamboni. It's it's the it's the Zaire Zamboni they call it, yeah. And uh, but the other thing that's nice though is they, out of courtesy to the uh, passengers, there's a slight vacuum effect oh, in yeah. the bowl. They, no, they're good. sucking those odors down. Yeah. No, I I appreciate that. Tell me what you think of this. And I don't know. I don't want to come across as the man, but yeah. uh, I was sitting up there for four and a half hour flight. I was in first class. Nice. And uh, got a drink, and uh, they got the breakfast and everything. I got breakfast thoughts too, so remind me on okay. the air, on the airplane. But um, at some point, I wanted some water or something. I was just sitting there, you know, three hours in this flight, and I went in, and the stewardess who's in charge of the first class cabin is sitting in her jump seat just scrolling through her phone. Oh, yeah. They should not be allowed to bring their phones no. on that fucking no. flight. You, that is your excuse to just sit and get caught up on some texting or tweeting or whatever you're doing. She was just sitting there, you know, playing Candy Crush or whatever it was right. on her phone. It's like, babe, you're supposed to be on your feet patrolling <laughs> this alley. Listen, sugar tits. On the feet, patrolling uh -huh. this first class section, yeah. topping off drinks, handing out waters, whatever you got to do. Give me a gay guy. Yeah. They work it. They mm. are so like, you know, it makes me so glad for homosexuality when mm. I'm flying. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, the, um, well, the first class bathroom also... Is for first class. Now, when I'm in coach, yes, yes. I get it. I did not pay enough money to sit in a slightly cleaner, slightly larger bathroom. Don't right. kid yourself. It's a bigger mm -hmm. bathroom. Uh -huh. And the flight attendants are better looking. I don't care. Yeah. The airlines, I'm sure they will claim that that's not the case. It is always the most attractive mm -hmm. woman. Yes. Uh, no, I agree. 
That's a no-fly zone. Yeah, you gotta you gotta obey the curtain or whatever that gauze is. They, they put should put up fence, not curtains. No, I I agree. Yeah. What they should do is they should take that serving cart they use when the pilot's <laughs> right. got to take a dump and just park it yeah. right there. That's where it lives. You're right, can't get around it. Um, you know what? I had this realization. Um, so I'm flying out there, and I'm I'm in first class, and I'm going to. Fargo, North Dakota. Oof. Yep, first show. Then four shows at the uh, Zanies in uh, Nashville and then off to Huntsville. Um, I'm sitting there, and this a, a long time pet peeve of, of mine is if you're in the back of first class and they're serving breakfast or dinner, or whatever, they'll They'll say, the menu will say, like, we got braised short ribs, and then at the bottom it'll say, we have bean curd with lentil sauce, <laughs> right, you know? Right. And you go, oh, fuck no, that. No, no. I want my braised short ribs. If you're in the back of first class, when they get to you, they go, oh, yeah, we're at... And, and they'll say, you want the braised short ribs, or do you want the bean curd? And then you go, oh, I want the braised short ribs, and they go... Oh, we're out of that yeah. because you didn't pack enough for everybody in right. first class. And by the way, everyone wants to braise ribs right. and not the bean curd. But you did a 50-50 split, yep. and now it's all out, and I'm in first class. But the thing that kicked the shit out of me that I was thinking about it is it's not only are they out of the one you wanted, but the other offering, which is the only one left, is the opposite yeah. of what you want. So we were sitting, me and Mike August were sitting in the back of first class on the way out, and it was morning, and they said, like, do you want, like, the hunter's omelet or the meat, you know, the meat lover's omelet with the potatoes and the, all, you know, the, the sausage and everything? And I was like, yeah, I'll have that. And then Mike said, I'll have that, too. And she's like, oh, that was the last one. <laughs> But, but what's you left? You love that. You love that. What's left is the waffle with the churro sauce and the candy corn on it because they have to go up. They can't. They don't go meat lovers omelet or would you like scrambled yeah. eggs and sausage? Right. They have to go savory and then retarded kid. Yeah, that's that's their thing. So yeah. not only are you not getting like, you know, you go order a pizza and you go. I'll take sausage and onion, and they go. We don't have sausage and onion. We just we just have pepperoni. You're still getting a version of pizza, right? Might not the top of your list, but but you still like it. Still yeah. whatever. But they don't go. Uh, what what would you like? Oh, uh, would you like? Uh, would you, would you like tri tip, smoked tri tip, or cotton candy? <laughs> and they go, and we're out of the smoked tri tip. And now you're like. I will take some other version of this, but yeah. I'm getting the opposite because they have to do the right, opposite. They have to right. do the granola bowl uh, or the meat lovers. Right. And Mike is a meat lover, and now he's got this Belgian waffle <laughs> in front of him with like candy corn on it. And it's like he's just like looking at him. Of course, he yeah. ain't no fucking thing. But, he's but still- the price of first class is so exorbitant. What's the margin on packing four extra meat lovers? You know, what well, is that, 50 bucks? Uh, not even. I'm sure. And then the, the, the thing is, is like, yes, Mike should have got a $200 discount on his sure. first class ticket. Yeah. That's my whole thing. Like, and, and also, if it's first class, you have to have, if there's 16 souls in first class, you need 16 of the braised beef and then yes. 16 of the, you know, veggie lovers right. being curd. No, I used to be a banquet waiter in Boston at the Copley Marriott, which was the biggest banquet hall. So we used to get the biggest uh, uh, conventions. And these guys would come in and it would be like a bunch of farmers from Iowa and mm-hmm. they would order the... The New England, they wanted the New England menu. So it was lobsters, it was right. clams, it was clam chowder. And uh, and so we would make, and then there was a choice. You could also have vegetarian. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we made not only the exact amount of lobsters for every single person, they did an extra 10% right. in ca- as That's fringe. That's what we do on the ground. And then we would serve the food. And inevitably, there would be 30 or 40 lobsters left, and all the waiters and waitresses, and they were all college students, and we were friends with the bartenders who had the little bar carts, 
We would drink. We would work a six-hour shift, and we would get drunk, and we would eat lobster every night. Mm. We would always have like an hour off because they would have some presentation, mm-hmm. and we just sit in the back and drink and eat lobster. It's the greatest. Doesn't get any better. No. Right, here's a hypothetical that's not really hypothetical, but it it I think it puts the the green movement. It sets it back a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you why. Now, you drove here in a Prius, so you're down with the cause. Sure. And it's really about getting as many people down with the cause as, as they can. I, I got all electric now. I'm driving all electric no Audi. Shit. Good yep. for you. Uh, yeah, I just gas is six bucks a gallon. Seven. The, the, oh, seven. The, stop counting. The technology works now. So be it. Uh, but... I've always thought it was funny that when um, James Brolin came in here and uh, he drove his uh, Ford Raptor pickup truck here and he was explaining that he got the Raptor that was like 2016 because it had the V8 Mustang engine in it. And when they went back after 2016, they went to a Durotech or something, V6 turbocharged like this one. He wanted the displacement the one, the big lump, the big piece of American V8 yeah. muscle that uh, would give that Raptor seven miles to the gallon, right. right? And all he did was drive here from Malibu. He just sat in traffic the whole time. He, he, <laughs> so the Raptor <laughs> is a trophy truck for yeah. guys who never go off-road. Right. There's just... No, I, it's like the old guy that's got the 23-year-old Swedish girlfriend. Yes. He hasn't gotten it up in four years. Right. And you don't even see guys in Raptors like hauling plywood no. or drywall. That's a Silverado or Ford 250. But this, that's a work truck. Mm-hmm. This isn't a work truck. This is a $82,000 trophy truck Shh. that never goes off-road. Yeah. And all you're doing, and mostly driving it alone, mm-hmm. all you're doing is destroying the planet right. with that truck. James Brolin is married to Barbara Streisand. She's Stry- very Streisand. 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 <laughs> He's married to her. She's into the environment, and her husband is doing donuts in a raptor on her fucking front lawn. <laughs> right. So how are we yeah. going to convince the rest of yeah. the people? And there was just this thing that came out that uh, Biden got got reimbursed from Hunter Biden and Joe Biden got checks from Hunter Biden and blah, 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 Chinese connection or something. But the, the, the White House is going, it was payments. He was just payments for his Raptor truck. And no one cares that he drove a Raptor truck. But to me, I'm like, you can't get Joe Biden's son out of a Raptor. And you can't get James Brolin out of a Raptor. Yeah. We're going to have a hard time convincing middle America to get out of the Raptor. And I never get why these people, I never get with the op, the optics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like where you go, like, listen, son, sorry, but I'm out pushing electric school buses. You yeah. can't be driving around in a fucking trophy right, truck. Right, right. I, I don't want that kind of optics. You're going to yeah. have to get a, a Leaf or a Prius or something. Rob. But also... Do you think Babs has ever had that conversation with James? Well, it's also the jets. I mean, forget the cars. I mean, they they fly with three people in a jet to right. Europe, you know, and and that's that's crazy. a lot of carbon. Well, yes. there was a one of the Kardashians got busted for flying from Santa Barbara to Burbank, right? And they were like, "What the fuck is your problem?" And they and they're talking about it. this isn't a little <laughs> Cessna. This is a giant jet that she's right. got. Yeah, yeah, lot of lot of carbon. I mean, everyone who goes to the um, environmental forum in Davos or whatever, they just park all, all the jets. all. all oh, did you jets. read about this? There was uh, there was a in Dubai last week. There was a an environmental convention, and four of the jets from Munich couldn't get off the runway because they were frozen. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, I saw one like tipped over yeah. or wheelied or, or something. Right. Um, so Speaking back- of uh, Bob mm. Streisand, so it's, 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 Streisand. Streisand, Streisand, excuse me, mm-hmm. and James Brolin. So James Brolin, in, in uh, Streisand's m- memoir, she said that they're falling asleep together, and James Brolin goes, I don't want to fall asleep because I'll miss you. Mm. Uh, and, then, and that is where and then so Diane Warren heard Barbara say that 
in like a 2020 interview, and that's where she got the idea to write, I don't want right. to miss a thing. That's what Propofol is for, by the way. <laughs> by, uh, by Aerosmith. <laughs> yeah, she wrote the song based on that, <laughs> that, line. that line. Well, speaking of songs, Fitzdog, yeah. we got to get you to weigh in on something here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because I'm super angry at the song Maneater, and of course, All and Oats are suing each other suing or each whatever. Other. Yeah. Whatever it is now. I think, order, I think yeah. we have a Casey Kasem thing that Brian Whitman, Whitman uh, put together for us that'll kind of kick it off. But then a question for you yeah. that I, I posed to the public yesterday, and we'll, we'll get some votes. But there's another song that could be worse. All right, Casey. And there they are, number one in our hearts forever, Hall & Oates singing about a man-eater. Just who is the man-eater that Hall & Oates are singing about? <laughs> She's deadly, man. Oh, the beauty is there, but a beast is in the heart. Hall & Oates were singing about Manhattan. That's right, New York City is the man-eater. Contrary to popular rumors of the day, that the man-eater was indeed Michael Zimbello. The hits from coast to coast. So I'm super angry at man-eater. Because it was number one, and it was number one the year I graduated from high school. And yeah. then I'm more angry at Maneater because people I know don't seem particularly disturbed by Maneater, the song. Yeah. They kind of like it. Jimmy told me he liked it once. I think he's just fucking with me. But um, then I started sort of drilling down on it. And I was thinking, is there some. I, I put it out to my Twitter people. Is there something worse than Maneater that's a popular, you know, charted oh, yeah. song by Absolutely. big bands. Yeah. And uh, they, somebody came back with a, a Kiss song that I may have, I could maybe agree with them on. But I, they must have been so relieved to stop wearing makeup because oh <laughs> when you're on stage and there's 15,000 people screaming and you're, you're rocking, that, that makeup fits. But when you're, when you, after the show... You're yeah. walking out to get something needed at TGI Fridays? Yeah. You, you look like a lunatic. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. When, yeah, when they're like Ubering back from the stadium, <laughs> and then they're, they're the back of a Camry, and the guy's form born, and he has no fucking idea. He thinks he picked up a demon. That's right. He's probably going like, Santa Maria, yes. you know, like crossing himself and <laughs> stuff, probably trying to throw Gene Simmons out of the car. No, Satan. Yeah. I mean, yeah. good luck hailing a cab while you're black in Manhattan <laughs> after midnight. Imagine dress as a full-blown demon. <laughs> Holding an axe guitar. You and know? you got a girl who's licking up the back seat of the cab. <laughs> oh, and then you pull into some red roof in that you checked into, <laughs> and you walk in and you look at you. I got to walk the sundries department because you're out of floss. And the person by the counter's ducked down, like freaked out. Or maybe you just want to buy a Pepsi free. Right, and, right. And you're looking for the ice machine. You're looking for the ice machine, yeah. like a mini shampoo bottle or uh, something. And everyone's freaking out at the red roof. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you go up to your room, and the lady comes in with the turndown service, and you're just sitting there in full demon mode. You just blood dripping yeah. down your chin, and the she freaks out. The pillowcase is covered in black and white makeup. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. That's uh, right. It's a lot of work for her. The next day, you got to get a shuttle back to the airport. You know what I mean? Because you're flying Spirit, <laughs> and you're wearing nine foot, nine inch tall clogs with claws on them. Yeah. You're right. You're so right. I get it. You fly into Burbank. Yeah. There's a bunch of people there who are flying Southwest. No contacts, you know. You run into some teacher from high school. She's freaked out. What happened to you? Yeah. No, that's uh, that's the life of Kiss uh, with the with the makeup. Amazing with fifteen thousand people in a stadium, and they're taking an Uber to a Frontier Airlines flight. Yeah, man, in full full makeup, uh, you know. Ugh. Yeah, you're right. I never really thought it yeah, through. Yeah, but they had to be relieved to get into their lick it up phase. I mean, just just trying to go to a movie. Maybe you want to catch the Late Show. Maybe you, you want to catch a movie yeah, after the show. It's a kids show. movie. Maybe you like animated movies. You or, like Pixar. Worse, let's say you're feeling a little amorous, so you go into a sort of local show, you know what uh, I mean? A little rub and tug yeah, there or right. something, and uh -huh. you're in one of those booths that were featured in the Madonna videos, yeah. you know, and 
she's dancing for you and you're in full ghoul makeup, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you reach down and you, you get weird pancake pe- makeup on your hog, you know, now you got this weird black streak because <laughs> you scratch yourself yes, earlier in the yeah, day. Yeah. Now you got on your fingers, you know, and now you're going for your hog and there's a black stripe going down it. Or maybe you'd go into a local massage place because, yeah. you know, you're up there playing a guitar right, for two right. hours and you got some back pain yeah. and you're in there full demon yeah. clothes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You not come in here with makeup like that. <laughs> or let's say you want to use the health club, the gym at the Red Roof yeah. before you catch the shuttle. Sure. And you're just sitting there on a hack slide <laughs> and you got these nine inch wedges on and you're sweating now. Yeah. Look, you want to take a schwitz right. after right. Show, you go into the sauna. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's a big puddle of black makeup where leather, you're sitting. Leather pants don't breathe in they the sauna. They don't breathe no. in that sweat coming yeah. down your face. Yeah. You're on to something yeah, here, Fitz. Right, right. <laughs> then, ironically, nobody's movie. kissing them. There's mm. there's no kiss when you're wearing no, that makeup. No, no. You'll ruin the other yeah. person's makeup. Right, right. Maybe it should have been called Lick It Off instead of Lick It Up. Lick It Man, Off. Get my makeup <laughs> off me, bitch. <laughs> Use your tongue, <laughs> lick it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's only right now. <laughs> it's only right. I would have, uh, if I could never be in that session. Like, first I'd be like, Gene, you're 43 years old. Yeah. You're singing about licking it up. Yeah, right. <laughs> Number one. Number two, it's only right now. It just doesn't work with lick it up. No. You can do, come on and do it now. You have to do it to hang out with us. Now, now, or something, but yeah. it's only right. Sounds like something your grandfather told you. Like, right. like you, you threw a baseball and you broke your neighbor's window, and it's only right to go over there and apologize. Right, right. That's what that is. Not licking it. You up. got chlamydia. You have to tell the three last guys you slept with. It's, it's only, only right. right now. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I'm glad we got into this. All right. Do we get any uh, polling on? Um, on uh oh i i didn't submit the poll yet no oh come but, on chris i totally before, submit the poll before uh, before you do that i want to get your thoughts on kiss as well because kiss just played their final show at madison square garden it was a big thing they were like this is our last show ever mm-hmm. and then at the end of that show they introduced their new avatars their new holograms and that's how they're going to be doing kiss shows from now on or just virtual hologram shows i guess abba has been doing this for a while they've been making two million euros a week no, with their virtual with their virtual concert. So Kiss is now going to do that using the same company. George, Lucas's. do you watch it in theaters or on your computer? You watch it in theaters. You go to the place and you and you can watch vir- holograms of Kiss or ABBA no or way. ABBA. Yeah, yeah. Two ABBA. million a week. I heard that they made hundred and fifty million bucks this year. ABBA did on ABBA. Avatars. <laughs> Avatars. <laughs> That's what they should call the show. Well, they're fans. Yeah. A good demeaning name for someone who can't afford an actual ABBA ticket yeah. but is going to the ABBA virtual show yeah. should be Avatars. Yeah. Because <laughs> you need to demean your friend who's going to see. Like, I saw him live at Eurofest in yeah. 1976. Have fun, Avatars. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll fill you in more on that. Take a quick break, Uh, and we'll see if we can get our polling going with... uh, Now, it wasn't Lick It Up. What was it? I Was Made for Loving You mm -hmm. versus uh, Man Eater. We'll do that with Fitz Dog right after this. Meter, the holidays are here, and we get to stuff our faces, and we get to shop. But here's a must-have tool for you. You're going to cook those meals, and it makes the perfect gift, especially for the person that loves... Something with some protein in it. Meter, smart meat thermometer, tracks the temperature of your meat and lets you know exactly when it's ready to come out of the oven, smoker, air fryer, or grill. This stuff works. It's an amazing piece of technology. I always overcook stuff before I had meter because I'm scared. I don't want to give people botulism or salmonella. Now, now I have meter. Always comes out perfectly. Don't undercook or overcook that turkey this holiday season. Or how about the prime rib? Meter comes with cloud service for limited range. And you can monitor and cook while you're watching TV or even running out to the store. The perfect tool for holiday cooking. The perfect gift. It's meter, right, Dawson? 
Shop Meter.com for the best kitchen tool out there and make this season stress-free. Use it for your holiday cooking or start shopping for your Christmas gifts. That's M-E-A-T-E-R.com. Let me tell you about my friends over at BetterHelp, the show sponsored by BetterHelp. Not every family or community does gifts this time of year. Whether or not your family gives gifts during the holidays, you should give a gift to yourself. Whether it's by starting therapy or just treating yourself to a day of rest, give yourself some love this holiday season. I love therapy. It's always been a big part of my life. Always been a champion for it because when you get your head right, the rest kind of falls into place. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient. It's flexible. You don't have to sit in the waiting room with the prying eyes. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Treat yourself this year to better help. Am I right, Dawson? In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. As we venture into our 15th year of podcasting, here's another memorable moment from the Adam Carolla Show's Ace Awards Archives. Get these motherfuckers out and give me some juice. Now for some new memorable moments, let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Fitz Dog is here. You should give him a follow on Instagram. He's right at the doorstep of 100,000 followers. You'd go to uh, at Greg Fitzsimmons at Instagram, and he's got live shows coming up. Shows coming up by Hyenas, Fort Worth, December 15th, 16th. Den Theater, Chicago, January 13th. And Atlanta Punchline coming up on the uh, 18th and 19th of January. Yeah, I was at, uh, did four shows at Zany's and um, in Nashville. And something you guys were talking about off the air, which is I saw for the first, well, maybe not the first time, but I saw the little sweaters for the phones on the... The sleeves. The sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess more and more people are going this way, right? It's great because it frees you up to say things. I mean, it all came out of, I think, Chappelle and Louis C.K. both had incidences where they said things on stage. And look, Zanies in Nashville is not a one-hour special on Netflix. You're maybe working some stuff out. Maybe you got some ideas you're playing with. You're a comedian that works right on the edge. You're gonna To find the edge, you got to go over a little bit. And yep. then go, all right, that was too much. I got to pull it back. That's not what you want on the internet. Right. So everybody locks up their phone. You enjoy the moment. You're in the context of the moment. You get it. This is just us talking. And mm-hmm. then people get their phones back later. It's great. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just going to be the norm. And, and I think it's just going to, you know, it, it'll be, used to be when I traveled around 10, 14, 15 years ago in clubs, no clubs had a clock on stage. Right. Now, 87% of them have a Love clock. Love the clock. Love the clock. Yeah. Everyone too. loves the clock. Everyone yeah. loves the clock. All right. Um, here's uh, some more apropos of nothing. But yeah, yeah, ABBA is making 150. Jesus Christ. Damn. Well, look, here's the deal. People, if, if you can, so here's how you know, humans work. If, if, you know, if you got paid each cinder block you moved outside of the house, that's one thing. But what you'd like to get paid for is um, something else, like ideas or notions. And then you'd eventually like to get paid not to leave the house. I mean, yeah. that whenever anyone talks about, oh, lucky son of a bitch, it's always, he wrote the theme to The Tonight Show and he gets paid every night, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. That, yeah. that The notion of... Getting paid not to do anything is the most attractive thing on the planet. There's a low-end sort of welfare version of it, but the money isn't there. But Dave Chappelle, the aforementioned Dave Chappelle, is going to have an avatar at some point. Mm -hmm. Everyone will have an avatar, and they'll not have to get on an airplane or have them be out of the brace short ribs or or with Kiss on the road and all the makeup smeared on the pillowcase, like you said. You know, the wake-up call fucks Gene Simmons up, and they're all going to do it. 
I think this is what's so when you're and looking, then dead people are going to do it. Well, they we're started have Michael it with Jackson uh, and Elvis. And, I think Tupac was the first hologram right. show. Mm-hmm. But I mean, does it really look like them, or does it look like Captain Kirk being beamed in and out of some place? I guess we'd have to see if we can find any footage of ABBA. The ABBA show, yeah. For some reason. I think with comedians it might be tougher because they kind of want you to interact and be in the moment and be current. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be ABBA, but it's not going to be a Dave Chappelle show in an arena or whatever it is. But there could be some version of it where he gets beamed into... 35 different 200 seat clubs yeah, on the same right, night. Right, you know, right. there'll be some scaled down volume yeah. version of it. I, because I, I was assume. just at a club that he performs at pretty regularly. And uh, when he comes in, he gives them one day notice. It's just a little club. And uh, they sell it out. They just send it to the mailing list. It sells out instantly. Right. But the tickets get resold for $700 a pop. Wow. To see Dave Chappelle in right. a two hundred seat room. Right. So yeah, if the hologram is going to be twenty, right? I could see that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what ABBA looks like, and and also you don't get to see the seventy seven year old version of ABBA with the hip replacement. You get to see ABBA seventies prime. Yeah, you know, They're no longer age. Yeah. yeah, I wonder what the Tupac thing. Because that was early. That was a while ago. That yeah, was like 10 years ago. I wonder if the guy who shot him walked in drunk and went, fuck, <laughs> he's back. <laughs> Shit. Pulled his gun out. Started yeah, shooting at the Avatar. He's like Patrick Swayze in Ghost. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they're... Tor- now, I, and I don't know. Is it all licensing or do they have to physically do something? You know what I mean? Does, does ABBA have to perform somewhere and it gets pushed out or is it literally just totally constructed i think it's all recorded on the computer yeah and, and that's what kiss is i mean the kiss hasn't announced exactly what they're going to be doing but it, it does look like they're doing something along the lines of this but yeah they do motion capture oh. and they record it. so it's not like they're performing live in another room and then you're watching the stream of it but it's, they did it's not a computer ai generated cobbled together mixture of songs and performances, it's a performance that yeah. they did it once. Right. That's the way I understand it. Right. Yeah, yeah we're looking at them where so it's CGI. And there'll be no there'll be no Hello Cleveland moments in the show. Because mm. they do it once. Right. Mm. Right. And they do it in one of these state of the art studios, you know, where they film God knows whatever action films or whatever with a dinosaur that's not that's a tennis ball. And then they they put the music, they edit it, they tighten it, and they just push it out they there. They press play and they just Wow. Let it By go. the way, you know ABBA has <laughs> always been huge in this country. In Europe, they're like the Beatles. They're the biggest thing to ever hit Europe. Yeah. You know what they should do to keep it like authentic? Because, you know, at some point you realize you're just seeing the exact same show that your friend saw last yeah. week. Like it's every move, every note, everything's exactly the same. When they do the CGI thing with the balls on them and the suit and everything, they should have one of them go on some racial tirade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right? In yeah. The, in, in the middle of a Waterloo or something <laughs> that freaked everyone out in the fucking audience. Like, oh, shit, this is happening. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or like, you know, like when Carlos Santana the other day was doing that thing where he's like, sorry, but there's only a man and a woman. And a oh, woman right. can't be a man and a man. Some sort of uh, uh, politically incorrect, could have had too many pops yeah, backstage, right, right. little rant, slight argument with a tech or something. Yeah. Like, you know, put some stuff have in there. Have somebody charge the stage. Get have a CGI somebody, guy and have right. him fight it out. Get yes. beat by the guitars. Yes. All four members of ABBA are just kicking the shit out of this guy. Yeah, freak people out <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Make it make it bespoke. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a show one time in uh, virtual reality. This was a while ago. It was during the pandemic. And I showed up, and they put goggles on me, mm-hmm. and the entire audience were people that had signed up to be in the audience of a comedy show. So I'm looking through the goggles, and I'm seeing a virtual club. Mm. And the avatars of the people that signed up and paid are in front of me. And mm-hmm. I'm doing crowd work with them. I'm interacting, and they're talking back to me. 
Wow. And I'm doing stand up, and there was about 100 people participating. The laughter was immediate. It was like being in a club. Wow. It was insane. That was, was the first time I ever heard of anybody like actually simulate a comedy club. Because yeah. everybody I know who's done it virtually has hated it. It's weird. It. I did it during pan- the pandemic, and then I haven't really heard about it since. So they have the technology now. Um, I don't know why, but somebody shot. I was looking at a tweet of a guy. I think he was at a subway or something in a subway, not a restaurant, but um, took a dump in a bucket, in a mop bucket. <laughs> have you seen this? I just saw it. It was, uh, I mean, it must be the subway or something because yeah, it's like, like a homeless subway. guy. The L train? Sleeping sleeping on the ground. And uh, it's officially on. So <laughs> Didn't what? Justin Bieber do that? Justin Bieber egged a house. I think he shit in a bucket in a club. Oh, that sounds sounds, yeah. sounds familiar. This, Allegedly. This guy did it right in the middle of, right in front of God and everybody. The L train. Yeah. He peed in the mop bucket, allegedly. He Justin, did. Justin Bieber, yeah. Oh, oh, Bieber, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's fine. That's no harm, no foul. The guy's mopping the floor, oh, and the guy pulls his pants down. Oh, damn! Sits on the bucket. Damn! And then the guy's mopping the floor is like, uh, excuse me, that's my mop bucket. I do like when he, it's silent. Then he picks the mop up and throws it down. Now everyone's and scared. And he's finishing! He's going back. No! Yes. Yes, he's going back to taking a dump. I think this is fake. Really? Uh, why why like is this... somebody filming it before? Like, why is somebody r- rolling video on this situation before he even gets up and goes to the mm, mop up? That's true. That could be true. I think it's staged. What's well, the you, guy? Staged, staged, but those are those extras walking no, by no, in they're, the background? No, they're doing it in front of people, but oh. they're, they're both performers. They're cooking right, it. I right. think it's cooked for, for wow. reaction. Wow. Could be. Outstanding sphincter control. If he can (laughs) sit down, release, clench, get up, fight, and then release again. Yeah. Yeah. That is uh, world class. That's kind of what I felt like on that uh, 737. Yeah. Um, So you say cooked. I think think it's cooked, but it could be. I have no proof. It could. It's just weird that somebody's filming a guy. Just mopping the the floor. Well, he could have been filming the home. I don't know. We got to watch from the beginning again. He could have been filming the guy passed out. I don't know. He's filming. All right, so he's maybe and and let's let's uh, let's let me query this. All right, there's got to be opportunistic filmers now do you know what i mean like yeah. hey there's some elderly asian woman and she's just walking down the street of manhattan and here comes a crazed homeless brother the other direction like i'm just gonna film it on the off chance she's getting sucker punched or uh somebody's tearing down pictures of abducted israeli kids uh at a college campus and yeah. i'm just gonna film it because maybe some guy, Middle Eastern guy with an accent is going to get into it. Like, may, we have potential. Yeah. There might be something potential right. here. Right. Uh, maybe that's going on. Mm. You think cooked, huh? I think it's cooked. Well, I but, mean, here's what's amazing about it is he releases hey. the buttocks, hey. but the penis stays in the bad. pants, which this I would be it. physically unable to kill. Ca- I can't cut hey. off one. There's right. one faucet. Hey, shit in right. The He's shitting in your bucket, man! Wait, the guy who's filming is yelling that? Call the police! Sounds yeah. like Michael Rappaport. Oh, it does. Yeah. Don't do it again! Yeah, and the guy's just standing there. He's shitting in the bucket! Like, the reactions yeah. around him might be real, but look, like, the worker's like, oh, no. Yeah. The guy... The guy who's yelling... The guy who's filming it is the one yelling he's shitting in, a, in your bucket? Yeah. Yeah, now I don't trust that. Sounds guy. like Rappaport. It's either it's Rappaport, it's got a lot. He's shitting in your bucket, it's man. it's very jerky boys. Yeah. Yeah. Ah! yeah. Or you know, they did that uh on um Jackass. They went into a, a, a hardware store, remember, and the guy sat down and he started shitting in the toilet. Oh, in right. the oh store. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was real. That was, that was real. real. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So my dream is over. I'm that sorry. was cooked. 
All wow, right. Jesus. Give a guy a break. He's having a hard day. I, I Staged and cooked videos for reactions like this are one of my biggest internet pet peeves. Yeah. Oh, really? Like, a, a lot of those like fights on planes or like people bringing like, a peacock on a plane, they just go to that place where you filmed Road Hard and they just make fake videos to outrage people. That place is... that is, right? Well, Chris yeah. is saying the inside of a fake airplane. A fake airplane. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That, that yeah. studio where you go to yeah, film there's... plane scenes, like it's just... Yeah. You could tell by how wide the airplane is. Or, oh, really? Or, like that, or like oh, the, or you can, oh, why can you hear everyone so perfectly when the plane's flying? Like it's just, it doesn't make sense. So people make these fake videos and they, they put them out as they're real so, pe- so everyone can comment and you make I don't know, money off of the oh, ads. Oh, man. Know. I thought we're coming undone as a society, but now we you're are. saying- no, There's definitely some real ones. We're all but. turning into cinematographers. So you're saying there was multiple shooters on John F. Kennedy? That's that what he's saying. That footage was- I'm, I'm just saying, Cooked. it all started yeah. with, with Mr. Zapruder. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, there's one. There's a film that is definitely not cooked, and that's the woman knocking her friend into a bus and almost getting her friend run over by a bus, which I found interesting, but I but it's more of a sociological thing. It's two women. Maybe they're walking in Europe. I don't know. kind of looks European. Well, the bus is on the right side of the street, so that's probably London. Ooh, look at you. You're right. And... The bus is going by, and she nudges her friend, like throws a little hip action at her friend, and her friend falls down and almost gets run over. This I mean, looks kind real. of does get run over by a bus. We can we can show you that. She bonks oh, her friend. Oh, damn. Why? Damn. I know. And then she helps her and gives her a hug? Yeah. She See, gives you're okay. Her. Now, okay, here's the thing. Here's the reason I'm showing this. Um. Women didn't engage in this behavior in the past. They didn't fuck around. <laughs> they didn't do any of the stuff they're doing now. They didn't fight yeah. in places. They didn't scream in the microphones. Like women were ladylike. Uh-huh. And the whole, just the whole realm of like fucking with people, that's what dudes did. You know, uh-huh. when a woman. When a guy got drunk and passed out, immediately all his friends drew a cock on his forehead, Naturally. right? Women were like, you got to help Tina to the bathroom and keep the guys away from her and whatever it is. Um, women are becoming dudes now. You never saw a woman fighting when I was uh-huh. a kid. You didn't hear them like freaking out, like screaming about, you know, whatever political cause or whatever, like having meltdowns and stuff like that. Now they're getting into practical jokes, like dangerous practical jokes, which was always the realm of the dude, like the dude who was like looking off the side of the building, like, I don't know if I can jump to the swimming pool. Friend would always push him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, This is women now. This is a new thing. Yeah. And I don't think this is an incident that lives in a vacuum. I think it's it's more of a way that's, that's sweeping the land. And I'll bet you this. Let's put it to you this way. I'm going to ask you two. When I was young, you know, 18, 19, whatever, dude got fucked up and passed out. You would tape him to the chair he was on. Put you his would, hand in warm water put, so he pisses himself. Put a cigarette. Or guys would pull their dicks out and put it in his ear and take a picture. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you take a Sharpie and draw a dick on him. You might put a cigarette butt like his mouth or something, take a picture, whatever. It, it was always fuck with, right? Women, 0% in that department. Yeah. I think women are now probably up. Maybe they're I think it 20%. started with punk rock, maybe like 1979 when women started wearing stud collars. And I Was Made for Loving You came out yes, in 79. That that's could right. Be it. Yeah, but women now, I'll bet you if a fat chick at a sorority passed out drunk, her sisters would fuck with her now at a higher rate. Than zero because it used to be zero. Yeah. Now it's woman on woman fuck with crime. I mean, this chick was drunk or something, but she was just fucking with her friend. Yeah. But she literally almost got run over by a double watch. bus. Yeah. I mean, it was not even a standard issue city bus. It was a two bank. It was a two lengther yeah. bus. I mean, Jesus Christ! Wow. I even know how she avoided getting run over. Because she got bonked. It into, looked like she was right under the tire. But yeah, the like back wheel was right near her head. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got to go back. I love that the sign on the back of the bus is cross safely. It's it's a triangle with a pedestrian in it. Oh, man. And if women are (laughs) fucking with us now, now it's on. Yeah. They're they're fighting and they're fucking with their friends and they're becoming (laughs) dudes. And dudes got the man knot bun on top and all the bracelets and everything. We're just, we're switching. We're switching roles. Yeah, I knew you always said that Men are becoming women, but the women becoming men. Yeah, I missed that. that. Little, I, but I think you know. that was part of the equation of in 50 years we'll all be chicks. But yes, you're right. Women women oh. are becoming men, and men are becoming women. So it's on, so, everybody. Going back to your case of like, what made them find this footage? This because looks like that's, security footage. It's security footage, but it's rolling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What made you, them look for this? Maybe she's pressing charges. Maybe. Maybe the arm around around her shoulder after she got up wasn't enough. Yeah. Um, so Dawson went out and played Oh, before, before we show, get to Dawson's yes. thing, um, I was just sent this. Uh, so the video of the mop bucket poop thing. Uh, was a prank sketch mm. from comedian Morris Cornbread in 2021. Mm. So, mm. Okay. Uh, God damn it, you're right. Shit. Uh, Dawson, well, here's some comedy. So Dawson announced that he was going to Austin to do a show where you do a seven-minute set straight, and then then you go so, backstage sober, and you go backstage, and you have some drinks and blow a doobie or two, and then you go back out and do another set. And so... He left the building with that last week, and then when he returned, I heard from the other room, Emmy say to Dawson, so did you, uh, do, did you get fucked up? And uh, Dawson earnestly, after pausing for a moment, <laughs> said, yes, occasionally I get fucked up. <laughs> and then Emmy went, no, for the show that you were talking about because yeah. yeah. he thought it was just a general, general. question. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. it was a general Austin <laughs> question. Uh, to be fair. Question. General and Dawson that was a question. general, that was, that was a, a fair answer occasionally. I got yeah. fucked up over the yeah. last five days. But yes, yeah. I misunderstood. Um, so how was the show? Uh, the show was great. I took it seriously. For, at, um, I'm, it's called Get Ripped. So it was seven minutes sober then seven minutes after whatever. Um, different material on each set? Uh, yeah, different material. Um, and I did not, you know, I'll usually get high before I, I'll smoke a joint before I go to the airport. Um, didn't, no edibles, no nothing. I stayed completely sober, um, until that day after my set. Uh And, um, and so I, I had a great, a great first set. I had everybody laughing. It was awesome. And then as soon as I finished that set, I went right over to the bar and got a double shot of Jameson. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was looking forward to it all day. The last thing I said on stage was, I cannot wait to go get high right now. I'll see you guys later. So I had my couple of shots of Jameson, and then I went up to the green room, and they have a, uh, a weed dispensary mm-hmm. um, that sponsors the shows. Is this mm-hmm. the Vulcan? This is at the Vulcan yeah. Gas Company, yeah. And... um they bring in, you know, they brought in bongs and joints and all kinds of weed. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I walk back into the green room, I walk into a cloud of smoke. Mm-hmm. You cannot see three feet in front of you. Mm-hmm. You got hot box. There are like 12 people in this small room. Like five of them are from the dispensary. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's constant smoking. So I all in probably smoked six joints at about nine bong rips, mm, um, damn. three shots of Jameson, and two beers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and by the time I went back on stage, I have not been this stoned in a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I start going through my set, and I'm like, and I'm, I, I don't think that I've got this. You know, a lot of times you go up there and be like, I got that. I, I know everything. Yeah. I'm on it. I was just praying that I got this. And at one point, I realized that I did a couple of jokes out of sequence. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And so that sequence didn't work as well. And so when, when I did it wrong, I stopped the show 
and said, you know what, guys, I'm really, really high right now because this one thing that I forgot to say, which is this. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had said that and then that, and I did that, um, my kids are going to be a retarded joke. Mm -hmm. Um, If I had said this right after that, you would have laughed so hard and it would have been amazing. And that made them laugh. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it all it all worked out. You stayed it true to a, the moment. I, yeah, it was an imperfect set, yeah. but I had to. I, I, I recognize <clears throat> it. I I also was like, you can't you can't go up there and not recognize or at least address how high you are. Mm-hmm. So, well, you can't go up and not address anything on stage. You have to talk about your mood. You have to yeah. talk about if you're not truthful to how you're feeling. If you made a mistake, if somebody drops a tray, then the audience doesn't buy it anymore. There's a disconnect. Might as well get the avatar. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Greg Fitz avatar. I, one of my friends, uh, she's called the show a few times. Um, Karen Jones was. Uh, she led the Pledge of Allegiance inside the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. She oh. was on Kill Tony. Mm-hmm. And one of the people who works at the mothership was on this show on Wednesday night. And uh, she was, my friend was sitting front row with some of her friends. And uh, this guy uh, called her out as like some IT person or whatever. So while we were getting high backstage, I said, hey, by the way, that person you were talking to was that chick on Kill Tony uh, that was at the Capitol on January 6th. And he goes, oh, my God, I'm going to rip that bitch apart. Wow. And he goes up to do his next set. And I'm like, oh, fuck. (laughs) So he just goes off for 10 minutes or so um, all (laughs) about, you know, whatever, Republicans. And... I had to follow that. Oh. You dug your own grave. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so, and, and you, you can't, like, this just happened. It's got to be talked about. Yeah. <clears throat> so I went up and I said, so, you know, I just want to say I'm, I'm really high. And I, when I got really high, I might or might not have said something to someone and then that person may or may not have spent the last 12 minutes screaming about it from this stage. I don't know if any of that happened. Yeah. I am high. Uh-huh. Moving on. Good. So it, w- it was handled. It was so much fun, though. <laughs> All right. We got uh, news. Sure. I don't know what We're not going to talk about the songs we hate? Well, we're going to figure out. I don't know what the poll is. I gave you a poll <clears throat> update. <clears throat> oh, you did? I could, yeah, I'll give you a little <clears throat> Well, we'll do it. We'll take a break. We'll come back with doing this. We'll oh, give you man. a poll update on which is worse. Yeah. I, I, you can't do worse than Man Eater to me because even though I was made for loving you, it's horrible. It at least moves in some yeah. direction. <laughs> Wait, isn't a poll update <laughs> now on stage three? <laughs> yes. Mandy. That should be a poll update. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back right after this. Just Thrive, love this product. So much stress, you wanna hit the pause button, you wanna breathe. Just Calm from Just Thrive can help. Just Calm's all natural blend of mood lifting, psychobiotics and brain nourishing B vitamins helps you take back control and feel your most cool, calm and collected self. Multiple studies prove it works quickly to soothe everyday stress and sharpen focus in as little as four weeks. Or, Try Just Thrive Probiotic. I take that every day. A spore-based probiotic that banishes gas and bloat in your gut and can help you produce serotonin, which is your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep. I know the founders of this company. I went to dinner with them. I've interviewed Tina on this show. This is a great organization, and they're dedicated to your health. Just Thrive, right, Dawson? With Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic, you'll have the ultimate stress-fighting duo to help you feel cool, collected, and in control. Get 20% off your first 90-day bottle of Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic today. Visit JustThriveHealth.com and use promo code ADAM. Stamps.com. Add Stamps.com to your wish list this year. They've helped over 1 million businesses save money and time during the holiday rush and they've been doing it for 25 years. We've used them here for years, 12 plus years. 
We send out merch, books, paperwork. It's all with stamps.com. Your personal post office, that's stamps.com. Now, taking care of orders on the go is even easier with the stamps.com mobile app. Need a package picked up? Just schedule it through the stamps.com dashboard. Give your business the gift of stamps.com so mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Use promo code ADAM for a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. And that thing goes up, I think, to 60 or 80 pounds. We use it here all the time. No commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter the code ADAM. Dawson, the sound guy, has a soft spot for the weed. He can make a pipe out of anything, and hawks loogies of brown and green. Puffity, puff, puff, puffity, puff, puff, he's firing up a bowl. Puffity, puff, puff, puffity, puff, puff, Dawson is always stoned. Fitz Dog in studio. You can uh, find him on his Instagram at Fitz, sorry, at Greg Fitzsimmons, at Greg Fitzsimmons. Let's give him to 100,000 followers. Website, FitzDog.com for all the live shows as well. So funny. You were so, we just played that Puffity song, Puffy song. Because I was just saying to Dr. Drew <clears throat> earlier today, I go, do we need Poofy and Puffy? They're the same thing. Poofy yeah. and puffy? Yeah. We use, some people say poofy. And we have the word poofy. It's a word. And we have the word puffy. <laughs> Never heard the word poofy in my life. You probably heard poofy, but you thought puffy. Maybe. People say, oh, that guy's hair is super poofy. Right. <laughs> it could mean puffy. But puffy and poofy are two different words that mean the same thing. We looked it up. Did there Poof, it is. Did Poofy get canceled <clears throat> last week? Poofy was derived <laughs> from. Wait, Puffy. Puffy is derived from Poofy. So Poofy predated Puffy. But. Yeah, so Poofy needs to be. <clears throat> it's filled with air, whereas Puffy could just be like something swollen. Yeah, I guess. It's the difference between Poofy and Puffy is Poofy is of or pertaining to something that is puffy filled with air. I don't think it need I don't think like it, does it need to be filled with air. Yeah. It's the same. I'm saying we don't need both. Yeah. You should have poofed on that joint instead of puffed is what I'm saying, Dawson. But we do need puff, but we don't need puffy. Or we don't need poofy. Fitz dog, you just use poofy. No, puffy. I said puffy. Yeah, puffy's your word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poofy exists. Yeah. and We don't need it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to think of other words that are redundant that we don't need. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to think about it. Give us some thought. I'm going to get back to you. I got this scratch sheet and a pen. Please. Homework. All right. What's in the news? Well, let me give you an update on the uh, the song poll really quick. So we tweeted out, which song is worse, Maneater or I Was Made for Loving You? Mm -hmm. Over 250 votes at the moment. Maneater is worse. 58.4% say mm. it's worse. Not much, though. <coughs> it's not a, not a foregone conclusion. No, it's, it's close. And some of the comments are, um, you can play I Was Made for Loving You at the strip club. Can't say the same for mm, Maneater. It's a good point. It's a good point. But a lot of people like Maneater. And, a lot, uh, someone, mm. and I Was Made for Loving You, someone said, that's a guilty pleasure of mine. No. Um, trick question. They're both awesome, someone said. No. Oh, cool. So, yeah. All right. Rank these three. All right. Uptown Girl by Billy Joel. Yep. We Built This City by Jefferson Starship. Yep. And Kokomo by the Beach Boys. Oof. Those are all tool tunes. We, we Built This City is the greatest. As we refer to. Those are songs that I would listen to, but with the windows up. On yeah. the car. Oh, really? And, and the the actual you want to know the actual definition of the tool tune? We say like it's a song that you're enjoying. Like you know, if Barbie Girl came on or something, <laughs> or I'm too sexy for my shirt or something, I might listen to it, but I would roll the window up. Yeah. I think it would be. 
I think the real definition of a tool tune is if you had a black Uber driver, would you listen to it on your phone? And and none of those would work for yeah. that. But you might do it alone. Yeah. I guess is right, what I'm right. what okay. I'm saying. Interesting. Yeah. But there is a difference between a shit song and then a song that is you know, you like quietly, but don't want to be judged about. All right, here's a shit song. Um, Hell is for Children by Pat Benatar. Well, hold on a Come second. On. Hold on. Hold on, Mr. Fitzdog. Yeah. That's my go-to karaoke <laughs> No, it's number. not. Yes. No way! <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. And the reason... <laughs> it's really good... Because I can talk it up during this part. Uh-huh. Do we have any kids out there? <laughs> Every once in a while, the guy who runs karaoke doesn't know what the fuck sheriff is. So they don't, they don't roll that deep. That's why I show up with my own sheriff. Yeah. And I deputize him to play sheriff. Play That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. There's a picture of me singing at Kimmel's house. Uh, from 25 years ago, singing uh, karaoke, which y- you can just you can just see from that shot how you know how how deep into hell is for children mm. I actually am. It's somewhere on someone's computer. But all right, anyway, Chris, what do we got? News? Yeah. So um, there's a story about this YouTuber mm-hmm. who in 2021 he he's a he's a pilot as well. So he takes off on a single engine plane. All right, hold They're- on, we can throw the picture up. Sorry. It's all can get a shot of what I'm like when I'm really Action. hit my stride. Wow. You know what I mean? That there's no phoning any part of that sheriff song or hell is for children. That is one hundred percent from the that, gut. That vein on the neck cannot take any more blood past <laughs> no, that period at I'm that going moment. hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's full. Yeah. It was so full that <laughs> Jimmy's daughter was like nine at the time. She came downstairs crying. <laughs> she was like, Katie came downstairs she was like, make it stop, make it stop. I tried, tried to go to bed at 8.30 yeah. at night, and at 1.30 in the morning, I was banging out hell is for children. She's like, hell is for children. <laughs> she did. She came downstairs crying. You made a, a girl in another room cry. In another <laughs> level. She was not, she was upstairs. It's, they all cry. I just asked. Right. They all cry. Yeah, I you cried. So. Yeah. All right, YouTuber. Oh, yeah, so something. he takes off on a plane. Uh, 30 minutes later, while flying above the Los Padres National Forest, mm-hmm. uh, he said that the plane's engine had failed, mm-hmm. and he had to jump out of the plane. So here's the video. Mm-hmm. But he's filming it. Or yeah, because I mean, yeah, he's a YouTuber, so he has GoPros out, but oh, okay. he's like, hey, engine has failed, and he just jumps out of the plane. Mm. Yeah. So I, it, I guess you can't ditch it in a national forest. I well, he ditched it. I guess, and he has a no, no. Stick. I mean, you can't ditch it. You can't land it. You know? Oh, right. You can jump out of a plane, but you can't try to land the plane. Yeah. So he ditched it, and he has a selfie stick following him as the the plane crashes. Mm-hmm. Um. So he has now been charged six months in federal prison for staging this small plane crash. Yeah. So, thirty-year-old guy. So he's, um, yeah, he he basically admitted, yeah, it was an intentional crash. Oh, he 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 announced it. Yeah, because they because everybody like viewers were suspicious at first. They were like, he's already wearing a parachute. He had no Mm -hmm. he made no attempt to glide the aircraft to a safe landing area. Just took the camera with a selfie stick and bailed. Well, again, I don't you know they call that dead stick when the propeller stops. Uh, and when a plane's like dead stick and you're in the mountains, uh, I don't know where you're going to put that thing down. You, you know what I mean? So if I'm if I'm making his argument, I'm basically saying, look, I got a window to try to get out of this plane. I mean, literally a time window. <laughs> you, you know, you know what I mean? And that time window is going to go away if I'm heading down and trying to find a place to land this thing, and there is no place to land this thing but so he kind of had that argument but then they could probably forensically like go through the plane although i don't know if they could go oh the carburetor was clogged the jet was clogged or something like that there's another interesting thing um (coughs) if you had a full tank of fuel 
there would have been an, a, a major explosion on right. impact. Mm-hmm. So we had to be really, really careful, you know, in knowing that Not if he stays in this, he can start a forest fire right. in L.A. So he definitely made sure, at least that's the way I think there would be a, an explosion on impact if it was full of fuel. Because there's yeah, metal, but, there's going to be a spark. But if you ditch the plane, you're going to start the fuel fire too, aren't you? If you jump no, out not of it? No, not if you have an empty tank. Well, so I think he purposely ditched the plane when, you know... Well, he ditched did the he plane. Did he say he ran out of gas, or did he say? Yeah, he well, he, he just admitted that the issue. he said the engine failed. But then, so uh, he was told days after the crash to preserve the site and inform the National Transportation Board where it was. Instead, this guy goes to the crash site. He used a helicopter to lift the wreckage out. Then, bit by bit, he dismantled and disposed of the wreckage in an attempt to thwart the federal investigation. Uh, he pled guilty earlier this year to destruction concealment with the intent to obstruct a federal investigation. Um, the quote is, it appears that Jacob exercised exceptionally poor judgment in committing this offense. He most likely committed this offense to generate social media and news coverage for himself and to obtain financial gain. Nevertheless, this type of daredevil conduct cannot be tolerated. Well, also you get into trouble for covering the crime as well as the crime. Yeah. Because trying to cover it up. Yeah. So he wrote, so Jacob has wrote that he is, quote, sincerely sorry and has suffered a lot of consequences from this offense. Uh, while I carefully researched the plane route to make sure the crash would not be near human housing or trail, trail routes, I should have never gone forward with it. So he did right. it all for the clicks. Well, he's going to be the only guy in cell block H who ditched a Cessna. Because everyone else there stabbed a cop, raped their stepdaughter, yeah, or whatever. He, yeah. he will be the bell of cell block H. Because I guarantee there's not going to be anybody else who's in that prison for ditching a Cessna. Right. Right. Or bailing out of yeah. a Cessna. No, it's like uh, his 9-11. Yep. Well, all yeah. right. But he fessed up to it. Yeah. He got he six, up months. six months. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a type of daredevil act that people are But, you know, when, when, we, when you hire people and they go like, oh, they want to know if you have a record or you're a felon or whatever it is. Um, you know, when a guy comes in, he wants a job and I see he has a record and that record is like arson, statutory yeah. rape vandalism or something but jumping out of a moving airplane well, the, i tend to hire that guy i like the cut of his jib that yeah the downside is he's he's a guy who doesn't finish a job do you yeah do you want him on a project of, he could jump out of the out of the transpo van yeah. before it comes to the board parks <laughs> just, you know, once you deliver these parcels to downtown he bails on it right. on the 10 freeway right yeah, yeah he could do that you're yeah. right but i still think i like the cut of his jib yeah because that guy, because that's a guy you could go, you got to come in Saturday, and he can't go. Geez, I'm really not up to it. You because you'd go, you're up to jumping out of a yeah. fucking airplane uh, with a with, that was dead stick. Yeah, come on, right? All right, sorry. Um, so there is a guy who everybody's loving that jumped off a cliff into a large body of water. So so this is a, a Norwegian death diver. Oh, I saw Ken this. Stornes. So he. He's a uh, he's Instagram famous, so he just committed the new or uh, got the new world record, 132 feet. Wow! And here here let's watch it. So first he starts off by throwing a stone into the water. Now people think that he does this uh, to break the surface tension, but let's just watch him jump in now. A lot of hang time. Did he belly flop? It? No, it looked so, like he went fate. Yeah. So the death dive, and if you do a death dive competition, you have mm-hmm. to do that pose. For as long as possible before you curl up into like a ball. And, oh, and really? Go, yeah, you don't go with your legs straight. No. You do. You do that weird pose, and then you go. Yeah, you go the, cannonball. You, yeah, basically. So cannonball. he could set a few records. He could set the cannonball splash record. Wow. He could send the deepest dive <laughs> record. <laughs> yeah. Are, is that ice yeah, in that I think water? That's yeah, ice. Yeah. This is this is in Norway. So. Oh, this guy. Is, Damn. Yeah, this is a cold plunge. Yeah, it's another guy I want to hire. <laughs> yeah, Steve, that's I need for to, sure. I need to pick up. Hey Bjorn, I need to pick up donuts <laughs> on the way, and I don't really think I'm. You're not up to it. Well, this is also, you're not up to it. <laughs> yeah, this is also why you want to hire him. So, the uh, the previous record was for 102 feet. Oh, he's one of these guys. And he did it. He's the one that said it. Oh, I love a guy who breaks his own. Broke record. his by own 30%. record by 30 percent. 
and not two a, years later. Well, don't the guys who really have the record that are the guys who fell <laughs> off, who tried to kill themselves on the Golden Gate Bridge? But, I guess, but survived. Well, I was just, I was just <laughs> I mean, there, and right, I researched the, this because I was curious if any. They just put. Are you ready for this shit? They put a net up around the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. It took so long, and there was so many cost overruns that in two thousand. Twenty-three dollars versus when they made the bridge in whatever mm-hmm. year that was. Yeah, the bridge itself cost ten percent more than the net to put around the bridge. Right. Which, by the way, if you have any commitment as a suicidal, jump you're going to hit the, the you're going to hit the, the net. Net. You're gonna run off to the edge of the net. Jump again, right? If you ever see like what the uh, circus trapeze guys do, yeah, who miss the grip, you know, they hit the net and then they go to the edge of the net and they flip That's themselves. Right. It's a be- it's a beautiful move. Yeah. That flip off the side of yeah. the net. I love it. I love that move. It's yeah. part of my childhood seeing guys do whoop, yeah, off, off the edge. So yes, you would do that. And the same, I guess, if you worked in a Japanese or a Chinese factory making iPhones. Right. And you wanted to kill yourself. I feel like the net could be defeated. But this guy, I like this guy. I like that it was frozen water. I like that he set the record. I like that he wasn't wearing some kind of unitard or yeah. you know, wetsuit yeah. or something. He just went full speedo. Yeah. Uh, I love that guy. The real, I mean, the real hero is the guy who rigged the platform. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, the, you got to take this piece of plywood <laughs> yeah. and put it on the side of a cliff, okay? Yeah. That guy deserves a, a medal as well. And I don't know, what is the height? Now, you got to look it up, Dawson. What is the Golden Gate Bridge off the water? Because these people need to be in contention for the well, world record. Well, maybe 95 feet or something. I don't know if it's well, above something 130. Something like 3%. Three or five percent of people that jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge have survived. Yeah, but it's not just the impact; it's the currents. Yes, it's very difficult to survive those currents. Yes, it's two hundred twenty feet. Oh well, this guy doesn't have the record. Yeah, I hope next time. <laughs> That's he, right. I hope That's the right. next time he pulls into a bar, he sits down next to a guy who tried <laughs> to kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> on the Golden Gate Bridge and survive because he's going to be like, yes, my name is Bjorn. You know yeah. what I do? And they're yeah. like, eh, 132 feet. No, he's from San Francisco, that's, Adam. That's cute. Well, not Bjorn. And that that's at no. high tide. So oh, yeah. if you go at low tide, it's it's much, a much farther drop. Anybody could tack 100 feet onto this guy's record yeah. who survived the Golden Gate Bridge. Those and a, are the real and a, heroes. And a tougher piece of water to get out of. That's right. Yeah, and sharks. The That's sharks right. under the Golden Gate Bridge. That's right. All right, so this guy didn't Pussy. do jack shit. <laughs> and I, I guess the reason he throws the rock over is because he needs to see the rippling of the water so he can prepare for impact because you lose like your depth perception. So people think it's to break the surface tension of the water so it's a softer landing, but it's not. It's, when they have... So there is a thing, another thing for Dawson to look up, high divers into water, like when they would do it as like a sideshow at like, um, it used to be a thing, Acapulco cliff diving used to be a thing. They used to do a dive in uh, in, in like Marine Land or SeaWorld or something. There was such a thing as a sort of sideshow, which is high divers. And they'd land in little pools. They'd land in pools, Yeah. Yeah. And they would bubble up the pool at, uh-huh. at, to give them a spot. And I don't know if it had something to do with softening up, but it would bubble. It would bubble, and these guys would do it. And whenever I saw this, any of this, I was always like, the jump from the platform at the top, which is crazy because guys can go full handstand with this little two-foot-by-two-foot two platform yeah. at the top. The hairiest part of that whole endeavor was the 90-foot ladder climb. That was like outside of the pool. <laughs> yeah. You have to climb up a hundred foot ladder, and if you fell, you hit the asphalt. Yeah. You weren't, it wasn't in the middle of the pool, it was right. outside of the yeah. pool. So that's kind of a crazy gig, but they bubbled. Have a video of a high dive record from 1984, uh, 172 feet. Oh, see, this guy's standing on that little fucking ladder. And they would do flips and stuff. Oh, my gosh. I mean, how crazy is the ladder part? How deep is the pool? He's going into Shamu's pool. 
Is it girlfriend, Linda? His girlfriend. Look at the face. She's talking to herself nonstop. I, I, if I were Linda, I wouldn't have attended. Well, maybe there's a large life insurance policy. Oh, no, you're right. Up there, eyes closed. <laughs> meditating. What's it going to feel like? What do I have to do right off the top? Oh, is that Kathy Lee Gifford or somebody? There's Linda. Oh, no, what's her? down below. No, that's never done this before. He does not know what to expect. She's doing oh, flips. Wow. Oh. Wow. He didn't hit well. Now, he could have hit well. Is that for timing? The dive was good. It was solid. He's a strong competitor. Sorry, Bjorn. You just got your ass kicked by a fucking American in a speedo with wonderful hair. He just did a fucking five, full gainer. I mean, yeah. he, did, he did the full flips. I'm telling you, these are the world's greatest it's athletes. One. It's a flip. I mean, could you imagine someone telling him with a twist and a so gainer? It was a two, two full flips and a half gainer. Put the ball oh. in. Imagine the impact on your balls. My Ball hands would sack. be right underneath there. Yeah. He made it. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I've I've jumped off pretty high cliffs in my day. Yeah. And and it's the balls and it's also the water you get up your nose. Yeah. Yeah. Very okay. intense. Yeah, guys used to swim with a nose pincher. Do you guys remember yeah. that? Yeah. It was the opposite of a breathe right strip. Right, yeah. <laughs> it was the, the same company probably made the <laughs> nose pincher. Yeah. When my dad got into the pool, he'd go with the nose. Oh, no. When my dad would go into a swimming pool, he would dive in and hold his nose with one hand. Like, you couldn't look, be, look like a bigger pussy than holding and doing yeah. the one-handed right. dive in my grandparents' four-foot-deep fucking pool in North Hollywood. But uh, I used to 72. I, I used to be a bubbler in pools. Farted? Yeah. Mm. That's why I like a good hot tub. You can just kind of... I, am I Mix right that the climb up the fucking ladder is the scariest part yeah. of this this equation the that this who, guy just who, did? People who are just getting on the pool, they're all they have wet feet, mm -hmm. wet hands, uh -huh. yeah. climbing up the ladder. It's yeah, windy. you're right. Got all that kiss makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Like just standing, the platform he's standing on is 18 inches by 18 inches. Yeah, I don't know. He didn't get airlifted up there. They have to crawl up there. Yeah. How many times <laughs> do you see people go up on a cliff, like friends, and then pussy out and have to climb down? You couldn't oh, do yeah. that with a crowd of people. Oh, no, just, we did that. Like, we 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 climbed up onto the roof of the Mulholland Club. We used to break in in the Mulholland Club when I was in high school, right? And the Mulholland Club had a two-story or three-story roof that was above the swimming pool. And... But you had to clear some patio. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like you had to you had to get a little run at it at night. You know, and the way we got up there is we went up to the upper deck the patio and we stacked furniture on top of one another. We're all naked, and we were <laughs> we pulled ourselves up. A piece of conduit was sticking out with a light on it. We pull all ourselves up and we get up on the roof, right? And my buddy Ray jumped. My buddy Chris jumped. Uh, I jumped. But it was a little hairy because it was at night and you had to jump out and clear some some cement. And then there was a diving board sticking out, too. You had to kind of avoid that. And I told everyone the same thing. <laughs> My friend Snake, I, I, was, I was giving the safety speech on the roof, you know, because everyone was naked and drunk and 18. And I was like, I was sort of sensible. I was like, listen, let's think this out because if somebody misses the pool, you're going to be in a... You were quadriplegic, yeah. like, and and I also came up with a theory, which is either hit the pool fully or miss it fully. Don't land half yeah. in. If you laugh half in, you'll get more fucked up. Right, you won't right. get half as fucked up. You'll get twice as fucked. I'm giving this safety speech, and my buddy Snake just runs past me in the night, and just goes flying <laughs> off the roof right in the middle of my safety speech. Snake would do that, and then everyone Checks jumps out. off, but our friend Rudy can't oh, get himself no. to do it. And he's on the roof, and it's naked. He's naked. And there's no way to get off the roof. And you have to jump because off the roof is you got to climb back down the stucco face. We took patio furniture and stacked it uh -huh. on top of one another with, like, a chair on top of two yeah. tables. Like, you just couldn't crawl down. But he wouldn't. He wouldn't get off the roof. Uh, <laughs> shame with that. Yeah. yeah. It was the opposite of the movie, Rudy. <laughs> where you yeah. would have done it, right, you know? Yeah, right. Still both acquired cheers. Yeah, also, like, those tall water slides, you would just see guys just walking down 
the steps of, of yeah. the top of the water. So I'm like, oh, yeah. why, why I, it's too long? I'd make more fun of them, but I just did that with a snowboard last summer. I was like, I can't make it down this hill with, on this snowboard. I'm walking it. So Rudy's probably laughing <laughs> right. somewhere. All right, Dr. Mike is astronaut. Dr. Mike uh, is going to join us in a second. Fitz, I want to hang out, talk to a real-life astronaut. Yeah. Yeah, all right, that's a ring endorsement. Uh, he's the guy, if you watch the movie Gravity, that Clooney's character is based on. So that's a pretty cool game. Wow. We'll talk to uh, former NASA astronaut right after this. Oh, 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 Riley Auto Parts. Well, they have a holiday gift guide, and it's here. So if you're struggling with gift ideas, they have something for everyone with gifts starting at under 10 bucks. They've got deals for the mechanic on your list, and you can save on work lights, tools, and more, and help those who like to help themselves. Choose from great gift ideas to help someone make their car look its best inside and out, and save on cleaning supplies like washing and drying cloths, floor mats, steering wheel covers, seat covers. It's all there. The Holiday Gift Guide also has the emergency supplies you need for your loved ones to stay safe. Save now on tire inflators and super start 12-foot jumper cables. The professional parts people will help you pick out the perfect gift for that hard-to-buy-for person on your list this year. Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts or shop O'ReillyAuto.com. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, man. Hey, I got a rich man, poor man. This actually came from my son being referred to by a number, meaning you could either be called by your number as a professional athlete or a prisoner. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Former astronaut Dr. Mike Massimino is joining us. We don't have a vid feed on him, but you should be able to hear him loud and clear. He's got a new book called Moonshot. It's available wherever you find finer books and uh, many lessons to be imparted from this book. Good to see you, Dr. Mike. Yeah, I can see you guys fine. Oh, okay. That's unfortunate, but I can see you guys uh, very clearly. Um, so many, many interesting chapters in your life story, um, set a record for spacewalking the most time. I, I believe if I screw that up, you, you tell me and, uh, yeah, gravity, the Clooney movie with, uh, Sandra Bullock, Bullock, that was a really, uh, first off, so how accurate was, was that if, if, in, and were you supposed to be that guy or was that guy supposed to be you? Well, uh, to to answer that second question first, uh, that was something that uh, came out in ABC News. Uh, They made me the person of the week saying that, uh, you know, it was kind of I think it was more like uh, saying that the movie Gravity was popular. And we uh, they they had me as their person of the week saying it was based on uh, some of the stuff I did in space because I was a Hubble spacewalker. The only truth that the character was based on me I, that I heard that I would like say, all right, yeah, I believe that was the director of the movie um, told me we were doing some publicity when I was with NASA to help out a little bit with the promotion of the movie. He said that he listened to my tapes and watched our spacewalking tapes. We had done an IMAX movie on Hubble and uh, it was a Warner Brothers film, as was Gravity. And so he said that uh, he watched those tapes and it helped him direct the movie. So that I think is where maybe that uh, that that statement came in. But I've heard that ABC News reported that. So and I haven't done much to dispel it. it I take it as a compliment. As far as the movie, yeah. Uh, now nah, the movie was was make believe. We never really had bad days like that. There was a lot of uh, things that were inaccurate. However, I thought George Clooney made a very cool astronaut. And when I see these space movies, Adam. I just care whether or not the astronaut looks cool. You know, if you want to learn the physics behind things, you got to go to school and study. If you want to be entertained, go to the movies. And uh, that one I thought was very entertaining. And I thought I he liked was, it. Pretty, Although he was a cool guy. I didn't think Clooney, spoiler alert, needed to cut himself mm-hmm. loose. I think he could have worked his yeah, way man. back. It didn't seem like he was going to. I don't know how much centrifugal force is involved in space, but it seemed like he could have salvaged that one. Yeah, I remember I think, one of the award shows, yeah. it was Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, and they made a joke. Uh, and then the, the movie Gravity, where George Clooney 
rather than spending time with a woman his own age, launched himself into space. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's Maybe that's funny the joke. reason why then. Yeah, when you yeah. saw that, did you think to yourself, uh, if that were a crewmate of mine, I could have reeled him in? I, when I, I, you know, I haven't really thought about that since uh, in a long time. And but when I when I did see it, and as you're describing, I remember the scene. The thought that went through my head was that no one would ever do that. Not only be he was the experienced guy. Not only to, that it would, you know, it's a stupid thing to do. I think, but also uh, he gave his crewmate less of a chance of surviving by leaving. Mm. And that if this was like a true, if there was like some truth to that survival in the story. If it was, you know, that in in that sort of situation, there's a much greater likelihood that two people would survive as opposed to one person on their own, especially since she was depicted as the inexperienced person. That part bumped me. Now we can move on to talking about okay. Bruce Willis's character in Armageddon. Yes. Cool. All right. <laughs> did you see Armageddon? I did see Armageddon. How about that scene where Bruce and his ragtag crew took on the moon drilling rover, jumped in and started pulling out wires and pulling out junk and throwing it at the NASA engineers going, this is junk, we got to rework the cams. <laughs> I don't think that would happen on the ground. Would you let roughnecks come in and mess with your equipment that way? I, you know, I, I, I don't remember the scene. Man. Oh. It's, I just, it's been a long time. That's I saw that movie years ago. I remember I went to the rap party that they had down at the Kennedy Space Center and met those guys. It was kind of cool. I think I may have seen it maybe one time you know, since the opening. Well, but, I've uh, seen it 128 yeah, times since but the, then. But the way, the way you're describing it, the way you're describing it, I think, uh, I don't know. Can I, I remember that movie. Whoever whoever is qualified to do the job is the person you need, and, and you could train people to do anything. And So I think they were, I guess, uh, doing the right thing, whatever it was, pulling wires out or whatever was needed. They got the job done, so I guess it was the right thing to do. But so it's still a movie, you know. And both those movies are kind of make-believe, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It didn't really happen. Don't but, ruin them for uh, us. <laughs> they were, I think, both very entertaining. Um, what's uh, what's your general take on Elon Musk and SpaceX and that whole world? I think overall, uh, the uh, privatization of space, some of these private companies, uh, it, it's a good thing. It's allowing more people to go. It's, it's You've got more access to space now. So people who want to go for different reasons, who and people who either cannot or don't want to try to become NASA astronauts or government astronauts, there's there's ways that they can fly in space now. Um, a lot of it is forking over a lot of money in, in most cases, but there's also uh, opportunities for research to launch more spacecraft, satellites, and so on. I teach at Columbia. My students have flown two experiments in space, one on a Blue Origin vehicle, which is Jeff Bezos' company, and one on a SpaceX vehicle to the space station. And these are student projects. This, this is unheard of just even a couple of years ago. Wow. So I think overall it's a good thing because it's increased the access to space for, for many people in countries and countries and technology. I think it's overall a great thing. Yeah, we, we recently spoke to William Shatner, uh -huh. who talked about going into space. And when he initially was in space and looked down at Earth, yeah. he actually felt an overwhelming sadness. That was his mm -hmm. first reaction. Yeah. Uh, because um, he thinks that we're wasting away our resources uh, on Earth, and it just it actually just made him sad seeing it as a Earth as almost finite. Now, mm. um, I, what, what was your first reaction going up into space and just yeah. looking at the Earth? Well, I think he was only up for about four minutes, so that was probably a quick look. I mean, he might, if he was up there longer, maybe we had a different impression, I guess. I, I didn't feel that sadness at all. I think we're living in an absolute paradise, and we're very lucky to be here. It's fragile. You have the the thin atmosphere that you can see the thinness of it and you realize, well, we've got to take care of this place as best we can. But, but I think we're really lucky to be here. I, I, I think it's a, it's just a paradise that we're living in and I uh, can't imagine any place being more beautiful. Uh, and you can see its beauty from, from up there. I think it's a really special place. It's a, it's a really nice home that we have. So I didn't feel any sadness. I, I felt really overjoyed that we have such a beautiful home. I feel sad for the person sitting next to Shatner who paid five million bucks <laughs> to watch this guy crying, That's yelling, we're all going to die. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just going, come on, dude, I just ate a gummy. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you're harsh in my yeah. mouth. This is my dream since I was five. <laughs> I thought I was going to meet my Nana. Yeah. And now I got, yeah. I got Captain Kirk balling away over here yeah. talking about how we're all going to die. And he's 95. Yeah, I'm Captain, 32. Captain yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah that, that sounds a lot, that sounds a lot sadder to me i think that other guy needed to be you're right yeah i don't think i think captain kirk didn't pay five million bucks to do that either so. you were the first yeah. guy to tweet from outer space yeah take that neil armstrong yeah, yeah. well that that uh, neil armstrong that quote mm -hmm. that it's misquoted i think he got it wrong i mean yeah. he, he he never walked it back but he wanted to say if, uh, you know, a small step for a man and then a mm. giant step for mankind. But he said a yeah. small step for a man yeah. or for man and right. man, man and mankind mean yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I, right. Did he ever, he said it was a transmission thing or something. I mean, I know he, yeah. he must have been rehearsing that the entire trip. <laughs> it was, it, was, it yeah. was great. He kind of screwed it a little bit, but I think we got it. I think we got to cut this man a break. Yeah, you <laughs> probably right. Mistakes, you know, he stuttered or something. I mean, the man was on the moon. He, I did ask him about that, though, Adam. Oh, you did? I talk about it in the book. Yeah, because when I was a new astronaut and I met him, I, I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember him on the moon. I was six years old, and he was my hero. I wanted to grow up to be Neil Armstrong. When I met him, I asked him, you know, how would you come up with that thing you said on the moon? I didn't critique his, his, you know, his, his English on it. But I said, when did you come up with that thing you said on the moon? And he said he didn't think about what he was going to say on the moon until he landed on the moon. Wow. And he said he went a little further and he said, you know, if he didn't land on the moon, he was so concentrated on that, that there'd be no reason to say anything. And and then he went on further to try to teach me a lesson here, a valuable lesson, which was you can't get distracted with the public relations and all that stuff. That it's a, you know, I was new to the business. He says, Mike, you're new to this, but this is a dangerous business and you got to do your job first. And not worry about that other stuff. And that's what I kept in mind when, when I was asked to send the first tweet and people asked me. I just channeled Neil Armstrong and said, I'm not going to worry about that until we get to space. You know, we got to get to space first. And then when I got to space, I didn't know what to say. I looked at the, the I was like, man, that, this is some pretty bad advice I got from a hero. I was just having vapor lock. And I just put down whatever came to mind. It was like launch was awesome and the adventure of a lifetime has begun. And then I got made fun of on Saturday Night Live as a result making fun of my tweet compared to what Neil Armstrong had said years earlier. <laughs> yeah. But that was the, that was the truth. I I don't think he worried about that too much. He was so much about the mission. And I think I think it's a pretty good quote, man. I mean, the whole world was listening. I know you guys are probably too young to remember. I don't the, uh, the one dude with the hat on backwards there. I'm sorry I don't know your name, but you look kind of like a young guy. I don't know if Adam or your other colleague was was around at that time, but it was the whole world was listening and uh I think he, he pulled it off pretty well. Third most watched thing in the in the history of the Earth. Yeah, what's the other? What's the first two? <laughs> Seinfeld final <laughs> final <laughs> episode. Really? Queen Seinfeld. Elizabeth the, Queen Elizabeth the second was the number one. What, oh, for what? Her death. Yeah. And then really? I, yeah. And uh, well, that's something to think about. You know, because uh, that was back in 1969. So there probably weren't as, as many TV sets right back right. then. We watched it on a little black and white one, and a lot of the world probably didn't have. Uh, television like we do today i so. think number I know, maybe that two good. was my dad picking up the check at dinner <laughs> <laughs> that was the most talked hey, about nobody could believe thing. it yeah <laughs> yeah people were stupefied Thank God applebee's yeah. has those uh, yeah. in, in restaurant yeah. uh, cameras <laughs> the yeah. um the thing so i was in huntsville alabama you probably spent some time mm -hmm. in huntsville sure, yeah. right yeah yeah big sure did, yeah. big lot of nasa action going off there yeah. and they yeah. have a uh, big, uh, I don't know if it's an Apollo rocket. I don't know. Seven. It is. It's a Saturn V that was supposed to go to the moon that did not. It was one of the canceled missions. Circa 69 yep. or something? Or? Yeah, early 70s. Yeah, so early Apollo, 70s? It, we stopped at Apollo 17, NASA did, and it was supposed to be in Apollo 18, 19, and 20, which they canceled for budget reasons, but they had already built the rocket ship. So mm. one, there's one in Huntsville. There's one in uh, at the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And one in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. So that's a real rocket. Yeah, no, I knew used. I knew it was real, yeah. and I figured it yeah. was that era. Yeah, yeah. And yep. I, you drive past that thing when you're mm -hmm. uh, heading into the chuckle hut to do the real work of yeah, life. Right. You, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Where the heroes much scarier. Where the heroes work, <laughs> and and you look up at it, and I was driving with Mike August, and he goes, I, I, he said, could you imagine strapping yourself yeah. to that, the top of that mm -hmm. thing, because everything was so analog and i said yeah the guys in the in the room were using phones with dials on yeah. them you know what i mean and we're going in this analog mechanical experimental world we're going to go up in that thing crazy that 
Yeah. Just, I mean, it's the craziest, ballsiest thing in the world. Unbelievable. Right? Yeah. You talked about the control center there that, you know, there was no email, of course, back then. You talked about the dial rotary phones. But the way they would get messages from, like, the back rooms of the control center to the front room where they were making decisions is, you know, those things like you see sometimes in the drive through uh, the banks, banks yeah, you know, the, that little thing, that, like, vacuum thing. system or something? Yeah. Like that. That's the way they got messages. They put, like, a message in a in a little jar and sent it into the <laughs> Into the control center. The other thing you notice, if you look at the Mission Control Center back then, the the you know the way it was, they still have it preserved as a national site at the Johnson Space Center. A lot of ashtrays. Oh These yeah, guys are smoking up a storm uh, in there. Too. Oh, you know, it's a different listen, time. Man. Yeah. So, if, if there was ever yeah. a time to smoke, it's during that launch countdown. I mean, yeah. if you if, smoke them, if you got them, that, right. I'm surprised yeah, the exactly. astronauts yeah. weren't smoking. I don't know if they would have got Apollo 13 back successfully if they weren't smoking up a storm in there. <laughs> Yeah. Also, you got to stay yeah. up all night. A lot of coffee. A lot of nicotine. Yeah. yeah. So, there you go. What year was your first launch? Uh, two thousand and two. So they worked out a lot of the technology. Still very risky. Still, I don't yeah. know, nerve wracking. It was still pretty. It was still pretty manual flown back then. Uh, the shuttle was a manually flown vehicle. Every every landing was done manually by the commander. Um, so there was very little automation on that vehicle. Now. You know, you mentioned you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX, and these 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 are pretty automated vehicles. So, um, which is makes them a lot safer, actually, and a lot of capability. You can't do exactly what the shuttle did, but but yeah, the technology the shuttle was developed back in the '70s. Mm -hmm. So we really didn't see a real big jump in technology until recently with uh, some of the spaceships. Did, using did you ever land on in the shuttle? Yeah, we. Well, I didn't land. I was a. I was not the pilot of the shuttle. I was a spacewalker on my mission. So, yeah, both of my missions were on the space shuttle. Launched. We did our missions on the shuttle. And did you land in like the Mojave telescope. Desert? No, no. Well, first mission we land. Uh, you want to land back at the Kennedy Space Center. There were two. There were three runways you can land the shuttle at normally. If you had an abort situation, you could land at runways along the east coast of the United States for an for an abort. In other words, for an emergency, you could also land southern uh, southern europe and northern africa there were abort landing sites but the primary sites when you're coming back from space florida was number one because that's where you launched from right so you land and then you tow the thing back over to the processing facility so it can launch again but on my second flight that's where we landed my first flight second flight the weather was really bad in florida we got which was cool because we got to stay in space for two days longer and then he finally gave up trying in florida it was bad weather continued so they landed us at edwards air force base so yeah out there in the mojave desert uh, the, at thing, edwards. the thing uh, edwards mojave yeah mm -hmm. yeah i know because i cleaned their carpet once <laughs> did you really 19 yeah don't ever that's pretty cool carpet cleaning <laughs> yeah, carpet cleaning is fine edwards air force base yeah you could do <laughs> you know you could do like a colony kitchen or a pizza hut or something but an air yeah. force base that's a lot of carpet yeah, to yeah. clean that but is. The, yeah. the thing that's crazy about the shuttle is it's a glider it's not yeah. powered. It's a Correct. glider that weighs as much as twelve semi trucks. It's I don't, big. The weight. A it's a Huge. weight. The weight. I don't know. Someone look up the weight of the shuttle. Shuttle. It's, maybe Michael. It's a knows. lot. It's big. Yeah. Tonnage. Right. Tonnes. Tonnes. Yeah. Tonnes. Yeah. It's like forty thousand ton. It, it's, ah, it's a lot. It's a lot, and it glides. Crazy. All from outer space. Yeah. You don't get. <laughs> To re, you don't get a second chance at landing oh. that thing if you don't hit it, and it comes from outer space. They somehow figure out when the Mojave Desert is coming underneath you or something, or I, I don't know how that works, Mike. You you can the well, a lot of the you know, endeavor weighs how much? One hundred seventy-two thousand pounds. A hundred and seventy-two. That's, pro that's empty. probably empty. That's empty. That's empty. That's probably empty. Right. So then you put you got seven people in gear and a big oh. giant payload in the back. Toilet full yeah. of piss. You got to keep yeah, adding exactly. payload. Exactly. Payload. Payload. everything yeah. you got. <laughs> yeah, your garbage, everything you're taking back with you. So a um, hundred and seventy-two thousand yeah. pounds, right? Yeah. So like an SUV is like five thousand pounds. So however many. That is, you know, twenty five SUVs. It's, or it's, whatever. it's really big. It's it the the payload bay where you could put stuff in could fit uh, uh, something the size of a of a school bus. Yeah, a but school, that's just the payload bay. You glide that glide that thing, and you yeah. tell me if mm -hmm. you have to wait for the desert to come underneath you or Florida nah. to come underneath. Like, how does it? How do you? Well, do you it? know, it hit me, Adam, when I was when I was spacewalking. Look back at the planet. I was like, man, we're a long way away from here. 
Uh, I'm glad there's people smarter than me figuring out how we're going to get back. And so it's actually, it's a lot of math involved there. You, uh, you burn your, you're in orbit around the planet going 17,500 miles an hour. And when you get about 180 degrees out, when you're ready to come home, you burn an engine into the direction of travel. It's like putting on the brakes. It'll slow your orbit speed down. Mm -hmm. And so you start to drop toward the Earth. You actually speed up a little bit. We ended up speeding up to Mach 26 on my mission on the way back, which is really fast. Yeah. You hit the atmosphere, which slows you down through friction. And then you keep maneuvering, and, and eventually you get on track. It's all planned. Uh, you know, and you're, you're constantly looking at where you are, where you want to be. Are you high on energy, low on energy? You're, you're a glider once you enter the atmosphere, as you say, so there's one shot at the runway. You try to come in a little high on energy, which means that you, know, you can't add any energy. So if, you're, if you try to come in high on energy, you can do S turns and a big turn. We call it the heading alignment cone. Military aircraft do that when they arrive at the aircraft carrier at a runway. So you can burn off some speed that way, but you can't make up any speed. So if you're coming in too low, that's a problem. So you try to come in a bit high. And then do these maneuvers to slow down once you get in the airport environment near the near the runway, and grease it in. But it was it was the talent of the of the pilots that did this, and I, I appreciate you saying how difficult it was. I was not a, a a test pilot, astronaut pilot. It was it was really amazingly talented, dedicated people. They practiced thousands of dives in a in a shuttle training aircraft, and then more in the simulators. Just for the one they were going to do on landing day. So it's amazing. Really I, I missed my exit on 134 East getting here today. Yeah, yeah, that happens to anybody. Because Bruce Springsteen yeah. came on the radio. That's all it took. Yeah, these guys, they figure out this patch of land in the Mojave Desert that you can't even see when they're up there, and they glide mm. this hundred ton thing all the way there, and at the yeah. very end. The guy just flares it a little. He just pulls yeah. the nose up a little, and he, he sets the two back, and he just drops very softly, drops it. Yeah. Parachute comes out. It's like a Southwest flight, right? I mean, was it even a jar when they? I mean, when no, they it nail a, it, it was a smooth. It was a smooth touchdown. And, and you mentioned the shape of the vehicle and the weight of it. It has a very a low lift to drag ratio, which means that it falls out of the sky like a brick. It's got little bitty wings, and it's really heavy. So it, the, the approach is considered to be an aerobatic maneuver, right? It's not a normal approach. It's just falling out of the sky, going about 300 miles an hour when it gets to the threshold of the runway. So very fast, very steep descent. Um, and the, it's the, the, I, like, like you said, they're able to do that and then touch down very, very lightly, a very gentle touchdown, perfect on the center line. But it's because of their talent and their, their dedication to – to practice, practice, practice to get it right. You only got one shot, man. You can't mess around. Yeah. That's it, one shot. And it just glides the entire just time. Glides. Yeah, it's that's crazy. insane. Yeah. It's so we don't crazy. do that anymore, though. You know, it you ain't know. happening anymore. Uh, I called my commander when we saw with the very first SpaceX uh, landing. You know, they they land in the ocean, and uh, my uh, commander, my friend Scott Altman, on both of my flights, flew in the movie Top Gun, the original movie, and was a Navy pilot and really loved flying and did a great job, as you've described very well, the landing that gigantic glider. So I called him up and I said, Scooter, what'd you think of that landing? Kind of egging him on because I knew he would have a comment. He was like, what landing? I go, you know, the landing of the space. He goes, they didn't land. We landed on a runway, <laughs> not bobbing up and down like a cork in the ocean. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was really quite an accomplishment um, for those uh, men and women that landed the space shuttle. And I, I'm really, uh, really appreciate you mentioning that because that wasn't easy to do. I, the notion that it glided the entire time, and that they could set it down wherever they wanted on the globe mm -hmm. from gliding, and when you watch it, you see him just flare it at the very end, yeah. and he's just yeah. gliding above the runway, and he just sets the yep. rear time, mm -hmm. and then softly sets down yeah. the nose, like rotate. Yep. The idea that from there to that, to to a landing where if you were holding a drink, you wouldn't have spilled right. any <laughs> any of it is an insane <laughs> right. piece of engineering. And whatever the math is involved from getting from yeah. 17,000 miles an hour in an orbit to dropping yeah. into the atmosphere yeah. and going, are we going to Florida? Are we going yeah. to Mojave yeah. Desert? Right. Like, yeah. 
Well, let me it's, ask you this. Adam recently had an issue with the size of the lavatory on his plane. Yes. Talk to me about yeah. the dimensions that you were dealing with. With the toilet? Yeah. Yeah, not very big. Kind of like <laughs> a closet. Uh -huh. um, on the shuttle, we had we didn't really have a closet. It was like a privacy curtain that you would uh, uh, pull out there. Uh -huh. no, one, no one really wanted to see what you were doing in there. So, uh, But, yeah, there was a privacy curtain on the top. and by, So you were in there by yourself, but not very much. It was like a, a really small closet yeah. that you would uh, open up and then go do your, do your business in there. And how does on that work with station, zero gravity? Well, you got to be really careful, but your uh, pooping kind of works as, you know, th your body still functions in those areas. Uh, so you just have to be really careful because yeah. stuff will float around. So <laughs> you want to make sure that you have good aim. The mm. toilet hole is kind of small. Mm -hmm. So you have to practice. We have a we have a whole training program for this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure, that costs a ton. On the shuttle, we actually had a, uh, the trainer was a commode um, that you did not poop in, but it had a camera looking up at your butt because you had to get your alignment. Oh, and, yeah. you know, it's not something you're used to doing. <laughs> On a flush toilet, I don't, you know, you might not like the one in the uh, in the airplane, and I kind of agree with you, but, you know, you're pretty sure that when, when you do your business, it's going to land in the right place. That's not mm. the case on the shuttle toilet. It was a really small opening. Yeah. So alignment was important, and to train that, there was a, a awkward-looking – you always locked the door and did this on your own when you practice, but you didn't poop on the thing, but a camera looking up at your butt that you would align in a short, you know, when he's closed circuit TVs and try to get the feeling for what it was like. Because alignment was really important. The Danny so Thomas was, cam. <laughs> yeah. You'd look. Yeah, oh, there you go. It was like. <laughs> thank you for that reference. <laughs> I mean, it was like midair refueling, right? Where they have to sort of get everything all perfectly <laughs> right. lined That's up. That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> I would say the most expensive but the most thorough Dutch oven in, in the world is breaking wind in that astronaut fire suit yes. or flight suit. Yeah. Right? That's the, yeah. Is that. How? Yeah. As long as we're going there, would you? Could you smell it if you farted with the helmet on? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it'll come right back to you. So the way that works is that your your <laughs> airflow needs your air needs to be circulated, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we take for granted, and well, maybe we do, or maybe we don't, but we don't really think about airflow on the on Earth. You, hot air rises, and that's because of gravity. So we kind of get this natural circulation of air, right, of cooling and, and air movement. Mm -hmm. And in space, there's no, when you're in zero gravity, you don't really get that convection. You don't get that, that circulation of air. So you, you have to circulate it with, with fans, this, you know, that, similar mm -hmm. like the air conditioning on Earth. Mm -hmm. But what will happen is, is in the spacesuit, you're wearing this fancy pair of underwear that has intakes on your, on your sleeves and at the bottom of your feet that takes the air in and then it'll go through a scrubber to scrub it for carbon dioxide and it'll return that air right over your head. There's a vent right over your head in your helmet, and you get this fresh air in your face, and it also kind of defogs your helmet visor. So if you were to cause some sort of odor to to happen, that would get sucked up into the uh, into the system, and it would be returned to you right over your head. And wow. it does not do a very good job of of getting that of cleaning out that smell. Mm. So if you <laughs> If you if you fart if you break wind you're gonna you're gonna smell it and only you are get you're gonna get the whole thing yeah well that, and <laughs> they say in space. space no one can hear you fart it's that <laughs> that's movie. not when you're inside only you can hear it inside your own little spaceship <laughs> yeah but you can't hear anybody else so you're in your own you're in your I'm own I'm guessing whoever's on the end of your microphone though could probably pick that up uh, you can hear the only way they can hear you is uh, is through the mic but what's the sound travel differently i don't know what happened with the sounds we've been talking about but <laughs> for example you can't your voice sounds different in space so you sound like an octave lower in space kind of kind of weird because you're at a low i mean uh, not in space necessarily but it's the pressure around you so on the spacecraft typically on the shuttle of the space station it's at sea level so everything kind of sound behaves the same right mm -hmm. and when you get to uh, your spacesuit and your ear inside your spacesuit, it's a reduced pressure inside of there significantly. It's 4.3 psi. So sea level's 14.7. Mm -hmm. A high mountain top in Colorado might be 10 psi, 10, 10 pounds per square inch. Inside of a spacesuit, you're down to 4.3. I just so hope that this interview that helps you prepare for your NPR interview later. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I, 
That's what, we got that coming up. How so, long, uh, you yeah. can't, so it sounds different. You can't whistle in space. Mm. You sound differently in space. So I don't know what, what sound could be picked up in well, that regard that we were talking about well, earlier. What Bali. was an average stint for you outside of the shuttle, like in space? Um, so for the, uh, for the spacewalks, we would plan for them to be about six and a half hours. Wow. But I never had one that short. Um, I, when the longest one I had was a little bit over eight hours. And is there uh, any propulsion stuff like in the Clooney suit? No, that well, he was flying around in that thing. Uh, that was uh, the man maneuvering unit that was used as a. They they tested that to go out and get satellites. There's an iconic photo of a guy named Bruce McCandless in one of those things, and he got to fly away from the space shuttle. This is back in the early days, you know, back in the early '80s when they were flying the shuttle. So that was a real a real thing, but you didn't fly around in it. What they found was is that the shuttle could be maneuvered really precisely, so you didn't have to go out and fly a guy to go get a satellite and bring it back in. You could bring you could fly the shuttle very precisely. So that really wasn't needed. Also a bit dangerous to fly that. So we did not fly around like like Clooney did in that in that movie. They do have a uh, a little jet pack that they wear on the space station, mm -hmm. and that's only for an emergency situation. If you were to if your tether would break and you're flying off into space, you could fly yourself back in an emergency situation. But it, it wasn't used. We didn't use these things the way uh, that uh, they were shown in in gravity. So you were doing. You were tethered then. Mm -hmm. Is a tether a tether or is it a tether with oxygen kind of lifeline? No, no, stuff? yeah, no. That would be an umbilical. That's a good question too, Adam. Yes. Uh, Thank back you. in the old days, like in the. Uh, like if uh, in the Gemini spacewalks, and the, the project that came between Apollo and Mercury, right? But it was mm -hmm. in two guys at a time, the first spacewalks, they used an umbilical. Right. And so the umbilical provided their life support, their oxygen and cooling and so on. But it also gave them a tether, you know, to bring them back in. With uh, the Apollo days and uh, well, Apollo, they were walking around on the moon. So they, they had a little bit of gravity to keep them in one place. Um, but uh, some of those spacewalks they did on a, they did some spacewalks on an Apollo on the way to the moon and back, and then for the missions we had with the space shuttle and space station, um, you don't have any gravity, so your your tether was really important, but your life support was self contained, mm -hmm. so you had a backpack that you wore, and so the tether was for safety only. Right, and we, we were out there doing work for all that yeah. all that time. Yeah, man, we're like repair people out there. We had really cool tools and working, fixing stuff and replacing equipment. And it was just, uh, it was like being a repair, a repairman out there uh, with really fancy clothes and a great view. What's the state of NASA right now? Or what are they looking? What's next for them? Uh, I think they're doing pretty well. They're, uh, their big project, in addition to what they're doing with the space station, they've done some really cool stuff uh, with the, James Webb Space Telescope. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the unmanned version of you know portions of NASA. They've done some cool asteroid missions. Um, so they're they've been doing a lot of cool things uh, with the with the people in space, humans in space, astronauts. You know, we still have people on the space station. Um, we're coming up on the 25th anniversary of the uh, first launch of the first element of the space station, and we've had people on board for 23 years, changing out those crews for 23 years. But the thing they're looking forward to is uh, with people is the going back to the moon. And so they have a, a crew picked out to be the first people to go back to the moon. They're, no, they're not going to land them, but they've picked out that crew and uh, their training to fly the space launch system, which is even bigger than the rocket you guys saw down in Huntsville. They're going to fly a big rocket on a, with a spacecraft, uh, Orion, and they're going to do a few laps of the, of, uh, of the moon and land and then the next mission would be a, a, la a land back on earth and then the next mission would be a landing on the moon um but that's a few years off that first mission should happen in the next year and a half i would think so they're, they're excited about that uh last question for you yeah. doctor do they Sir. what do we know about mining and precious metals and mm. garbage disposal you know dumping mm. stuff that we don't want you know i don't know nuclear whatever because we waste from a plant mm -hmm. or something like what yeah. what do you know about turning it into a kind of a dump site and what do you know about precious metals that we might need yeah. for battery operated everything or stuff we can't even think of well, I think um, the idea of, of you know trying to get pollution or things that are harmful to us here on Earth off our planet is a good one. 
it's not so easy because it's so expensive to launch things. But as the price for launching things goes down, that would be a nice option to to be able to take these harmful things to people and get them off of our planet. I think space exploration is is more about uh, our life on Earth and how it can be improved um, than it is about trying to find someone place else to live because there's nothing like this planet. You know, the, the sadness that you talked about with Captain Kirk, I, I, I think maybe part of it is, is that this is our only option. We need to take care of it, but I, I think we will. And one way might be to, to move some of that uh, unwanted material off of our planet and dispose of it in space. So that's a real possibility. We're not start there with yet. the cast from The View. Am I right, Fitz Dog? Hey, <laughs> throw Shatner in that, no, in that capsule, no, too. No comment on that one. But uh, <laughs> Well, what yeah. about mining and precious yeah. materials? So that certainly is a possibility. They just had a sample return from an asteroid, NASA did, to see what it's made out of. Uh, that Some of these are made of precious metal, uh, metals, these asteroids are, and that is, uh, uh, it's, it's been, these are things that have been proposed for many years, like decades, mm-hmm. you know, uh, getting energy sources from the, from space, whether it be a solar powered satellite or harvesting energy sources on the moon or, uh, mining an asteroid for its precious metals. These are, people have been talking about this stuff for a long time. Um, there haven't been possible and still are not, but I think we're getting closer to that, but Certainly, they are made of precious metals, some of these gigantic objects, these big rocks that are out there. And if they could safely get out there and either bring one back close to Earth or take a sample and bring it back, we're, we're just starting to take steps to do that. That would certainly be a – that certainly is possible. I think these things are going to happen. It's just what the timeline is, whether it's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 100 years, who knows. But I think these things eventually will be happening. I'm just picturing a giant – satellite or uh, a giant meteor made of diamonds and De Beers shooting it down. Yeah. <laughs> shooting down the harvest yeah. vessel yeah. when it goes up there with a De Beers funded yeah. rocket. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to think about diamonds, gold, you know, platinum, you know, precious. It's all about the rarity, scarcity. You know, and whatever. Yeah. And now big, something the size, half size of Texas comes down made of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, well, some of the, some mm. of the precious metals are things that we can be used in, like building semiconductors, and yeah, you know, it's not just the diamonds. You know, it's it's also materials that can help us well, with to, building more technology. To, listen, not to poke holes in my own joke, but like anyone yeah. who's cut masonry or tile uses a diamond yeah. blade. Like all the all the Ooh, all the stuff yeah. I used to use in construction and stuff is like diamond blades on wet saws. There's a ton of industrial yeah. applications for that. Yeah. I usually don't screw my own jokes that badly up, but uh, Mike's right. Sometimes you got to <laughs> grab it. Sometimes you got to <laughs> grab it. Dr. Mike Massimo. I hope I got that right. Massimino. But Massimino. Oh, God That's why just, just call me Mass, Adam. Just, mm, it's just no. Massimino. Just butcher it. Massanino. Are you from yeah, Baltimore, Massanino. by the way? Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, from uh, from New York. Where? Why, are you from Baltimore? No, I heard. A little, I thought I heard like a little Jersey kind of accent from you. No, no. No, yeah, well, I'm from. Uh, I grew up uh, just outside of Queens in Long Island. No, oh, nice. Yeah, Franklin Square is my hometown. Okay. All right. I screwed up. Sorry, no, Doctor Mark. Doctor Mass. Don't worry about it. There you uh, go. Moonshot, name of the books available wherever you buy finer books. Learn all the lessons you need to learn in life from this hero. It was great talking to you, Doctor. I, I enjoyed it. it, man. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, guys. All three of you. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, I, I, good questions, man. I enjoyed it. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like, I like asking a good question. He was great. Yeah. yeah. Very Love that guy. Yeah. Been there and done that. All right, uh, I'm going to be in Vegas at Jimmy's Club doing a couple shows uh, Thursday, if you want to come out and say hi. And then uh, Rancho Mirage at the Agua Caliente Casino. They'll be doing stand-up there, second show. First show sold out December 16th, but we added a second show. So you can go to mcrow.com for all the live shows. And oh, then Solana Fitz, Beach. Oh, Solana Beach coming up January 7th as well. Fitz Dog will be there. That's yeah. right, and Jody Miller. So come out and see how the sausage is made, or as I like to say, see how the fudge is packed. I know yeah. some sausage being made sounds grotesque to me. Yeah, what about a little Everyone sausage with some chocolate on it? 
How about how the sausage packs the fudge? Yes. Come on out to Solana Beach and see that. <laughs> Fitz Dog, let's get him to 100,000 followers at Fitz Dog. Sorry, at Greg Fitzsimmons is where you go on Instagram, and FitzDog.com is where you go for all the live shows. He's going to be in Fort Worth at Hyenas. Mm-hmm. December 15th through the 16th. Chicago at the Den Theater, January 13th. And the Punchline in Atlanta, January 18th through the 20th. And until next time, Sam Crow for Fitz Dog and Dr. Mike or Dr. Mass and Chris Max Bata saying mahalo.